Call the roll, please. Ms. Prouse? Here. Mrs. Schuker? Here. Mr. Suchaki? Here. Mrs. Zetter? Here. Mr. Dobbins? Here. Five present, none absent. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome all students, staff, parents, and interested community members to tonight's Board of Education meeting. The board values and encourages public comment on education issues. Anyone having interest in the actions of the board may participate during the public comments portion of this meeting. Please identify yourself on the sign-in sheet. A copy of the board meeting agenda is available to review on our school district's website. Please sign with your cell phone to go to the meeting. And I thank you. And with that, let's uh, please say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, may I have a motion to approve the evening's agenda? Second. So, motion removes. I'll second. Any discussion or updates, Mr. Evans? Mr. Well, it looks like Mrs. Mead is not here, so we'll remove uh, presentation A from the schedule. Okay. Very good. Uh, with that uh, one change, uh, should I move to a vote then, please? Mrs. Schuker. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Ms. Prouse. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Mrs. Edder. Aye. Motion passes 5 0, and we're moving on to agenda item 3 presentations. I'll turn it over to Mr. Evans. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Janatovich, and he can lead off with the First Ring Leadership Academy. Um, the students are going to be doing most of the talking, but I wanted to take a little bit of the time to kind of explain what the First Ring Leadership Academy is. Um, the First Ring is an organization that works out of the um, ESC of Northeastern Ohio, and it is all the suburbs that are connected to Cleveland schools. Um, it's an opportunity to bring these groups of schools together to talk about um, issues, curricular pieces, and, and it's just a good support system. But one of the strengths is they do have a leadership academy where they look for juniors and sophomores to be able to come together <coughs> and put them through. It, it, it's a pretty rigorous um, program throughout the, entire of the, the entirety of the year. We had an opportunity to go to a lot of on-site. We had some virtual um, training sessions for the students. We've seen some professional athletes. We had the opportunity to go down to Columbus and meet with all the students from the Columbus first rank. So the Cleveland and Columbus came through. Warren Mink Moon, Hall of Fame quarterback, was the keynote speaker, took the time to talk to the students, take pictures with them, and talk about his leadership story. Um, so we had a lot of opportunities to talk, to develop, to interact um, with students from schools all the way across Cleveland to share, to develop our, our ideas. One of the tasks is, it's called YPAR. It's talking about using your ability to do research to be able to identify a problem potentially in the school, to gather some research, and they actually went through the research process where they um, surveyed students, they surveyed teachers, they formed hypothesis from this, they collected the data, they analyzed the data, and, and their ultimate goal is to try to find a solution of something that they feel strongly can benefit and impact our school in a positive way. Um, all of the students, there's four of them here. Um, Henry is not um, here today. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves when they come on up and kind of give their presentation. Um, but, but each of the students has put a lot of effort and time, but they're also involved in a lot. So true leadership, true leaders of our school. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to have them kind of come up and, and, and share their presentation and, and maybe share a little bit, introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their experience really quick, and then get into the presentation here. Um, to kind of show you what they came up with and what some of the results are. So. Hi everybody, I am Charles Lagos. 
Um, I'm a sophomore here at Cario Heights. I'm not being rude, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, <laughs> and I would just like to uh, thank you all for coming and listening to our, uh, you know, just proposal for this program that we think will benefit our school. All right, so picture this, right? Walking into a test with a sinking feeling after not understanding the test material is a common experience across the student body, especially after the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Learning loss and a loss of study skills is a huge problem that awoke from this pandemic. And this is why us students from Kaiga Heights are here to propose our idea of a student-led tutoring program, as it says on the board. Overall issue, we noticed that the students of our school are set back academically and socially due to COVID. This has caused a gap that makes students stressed out and confused. Take students like us who feel that online studying and school took, online studying in school, like online school, to weigh valuable class time and study skills. These feelings led to the question, the big question, could a tutoring program benefit our school? <laughs> um, so my name is Braylon McClarty. I'm a sophomore here. I uh, run track, play basketball, and yeah. So um, <laughs> our uh, research method. Um, so our research method to answer this question, we sent out a Google form survey through Principal Janovich that got sent out to the high school students and the high school teachers. We had 13.5 percent of our student body respond which is a pretty good rate for knowing how small our school district is. And then 45% of the teachers uh, responded to our service and out by Mr. Um, I'm, oh, thank you. I'm Ava Gaelic, I'm a sophomore, and I play soccer and basketball. Sorry. Okay, so this is a graph from the student survey where we asked, since COVID, do you feel behind in your education? And they had to rank their opinions from one, barely behind, to five, extremely behind. Um, as you can see, 47.7% or almost half of the students felt that they were more behind now than in past years. And of that, 24.6% felt that they were a level four, which is pretty behind or higher. And we also asked a short answer question of, how would a tutoring program benefit you? And here were direct quotes from them. Um, have, I feel like a personal tutor would benefit me by helping me understand things more when I just can't get certain things down. And yeah, here are the things. Hello, uh, I'm Macy Wojtek. I'm a junior at Cuyahoga Heights, the only junior in this group. And I play golf and I do swimming and I'm in theater. Um, so I cover the uh, teacher-led section and we sent out the question of um, how far are students how far behind are students compared to years past so obviously level one is not at all behind and level five is extremely behind and as you can see here 38.9 percent of our teacher um, teacher responses are on level four which means that they believe that students are almost set back almost a couple of months compared to years past which is quite the dilemma. <laughs> um, here we also asked a response and it's like, what do you think that the students would benefit from if, it, if we were to instill a pro student program, what would the students benefit from? And most of these responses are about social skills and students interacting with other students and students' work ethic. And it's not even that the students are behind educationally, educationally it's just more of the fact that students need someone to interact with and someone to hammer down this material and just talk about it with instead of trying to figure it out by themselves. Yeah, we have to, we have to wrap up for Henry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to bridge our gap, uh, we think a student-led um, volunteer-based tutoring program would help benefit us. Um, students who are comfortable, confident, and clear by teachers would, would tutor other students and um, they would do this during times, whether it be in the morning, lunch, after school, they could set up times with teachers and it would, they would kind of have like a monitor there to help them if they did need help with uh, tutoring the other student. Um, and kids would be able to sign up for specific classes. So say example, you're struggling in math, you could go sign up for math or English and et cetera.
Um, hopefully this tutoring program will not only unify our school, but it will benefit those who might be struggling during this time and in the future. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> What just idea, like, would, like, students be able to get volunteer hours? Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, like, that was, our main that benefit. Yeah. It's supposed to be kind of like a um, symbiotic relationship, so mm -hmm. the one student gets to stop. The one student gets um, the education, and the other student can get possible service hours and try and record those points before they have to graduate. And I'm, I'm so excited that Dr. Freed's in the house today because, you know, we started having conversations as to how does this look? Now, this, there's celebrations, so on Friday, we're going to St. Michael's Woodside, every school district's gonna be there. They're gonna have to do this presentation in front of all 23 schools that are participating in this, all their principals, all the superintendents, and then have an opportunity to interact with everyone there. Now, luckily, I'm their advisor on this. I've kind of been working with this, but a lot of times it's the teacher and they have to sell the principal. They sold me day one, so I know this is something that I at least am going to support Mr. Evans. He's kind of saw it here, but we'll have that conversation. But I think that with, with the addition of the MTSS and notifying, A, there's kids that, hey, we've identified kids that need some support. Now we have a system that potentially could be in place to facilitate that. But then additionally, I like the student-led piece of students identifying that they need support. And kids, I see it just from hearing from them, there's kids that just want to help and just having that interaction um, with other students because there's kids that have gifts um, and having that opportunity to shine and to be able to help and support. So mm -hmm. it'll, be, it'll be cool to see how it all plays out, um, you know, at the end of this year and then into next school year. Thank you. And I think you, is, is Braylon signing covers of the ESC magazine? I think I, I saw the ESC. If you did, if you got your ESC magazine, Braylon was on the cover with Warren Moon, the ESC magazine that went out to everybody in the county. So, so, so is Ava. She was there. Was it Ava too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were they were mad because they wanted to take a picture of Warren Moon, and right when they got up there, they were like, "No more pictures. Everyone get through." So I couldn't take a picture. But the professional photographer took the picture, sent it to me, and it made the actual magazine miss. Like, okay. <laughs> All right. Next up, Dr. Freed. And this is oh. kind of a two part presentation for us. This is. Uh, MTSS, and this is the Greenhouse Project, the Hoop House Project that uh, he and Ms. Mason worked on collaboratively, and Mr. Nornberg. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. I have slightly less to say than perhaps Mr. Jantovsky. <laughs> we are split into two. Uh, Mr. Muccio is kind of involved in our uh, Greenhouse Project, but students are going to talk you through. Um, and in his conversation with us, he thought it would be good for these guys to come in and give the board an update on what we're doing through the Greenhouse. So that's kind of the lead into the uh, probably much drier MTSS conversation I'll have with you guys afterwards. But they have like uh, they have they have some prepared material, so I'm gonna stop talking and hand it over. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not I I'm not involved in the practice of their part, so I'm I'm stepping aside at this point. Good, good. I'll click, I'll click, I'll click, I'll click, and you're there. Great. My name's Logan Harridge. Burns. And this is our Hoop House Greenhouse Project for Geometry. Okay. The idea and the process. At the beginning of the year, the class was um, tasked with researching greenhouses for a class project. Um, we researched different types of greenhouses and then we formed groups on what we liked and what we didn't like and then researched more. And then when we came back from Christmas break, we realized that we wouldn't have enough time to plant and build. And then as in, and when I was in a meeting with Mr. Edmonds, he had proposed the idea of a hoop house. Um, I went back and proposed it to my class. We did some more research and then realized that would be best for us. Um, we did some budgeting and then we had some guest speakers. So some of the guest speakers were Mrs. Mr. Muccio, Mrs. Martin, they helped us with budgeting. 
Mr. Garcia had with, with the construction. Mr. Evans helped us with finding the hoop house and really getting the basics down for a greenhouse. Then Mr. Young and Mr. Burek helped us go through our uh, plans and really helped us fill in the holes. Um, once we had got, got the grant money, we purchased the supplies through a greenhouse company online for the kit, and then we took a class field trip to the hoop house. So what is a hoop house? A hoop house is a semicircular building in shape, and it's made out of a ton of steel and protective plastics. And the benefit of a hoop house is that the hoop house design is allowed for heat, will allow heat to be contained inside of it to preserve the crops and grow year round. Why we chose the hoop house? Uh -huh. So we chose the hoop house because we would like to plant um, plants this year, possibly, we don't know yet if that's going to be possible. Um, it will be an easier building process. It is a cheaper option. Um, more insight on the hoop house is with Mr. Edmonds. Um, better sun quality for the plants, and we'll, we'll be able to add additions later. Um, um, the location we decided on was behind the softball field dugout. It is going to be a 10 foot by 20 foot area. It's mainly flat and level. Um, it has working electrical and non functioning water at the current moment, but we are working on it right now to have water access by the summer. So, budgeting. Originally, we had a grant of $7,000, but we only spent approximately $3,500 of it. And Mrs. Martin helped us with the, uh, with the budget sheet. I made it very easy to break things down. So first off, we got the hoop house kit, and then we needed wood for the foundation and the raised beds that we're putting inside. Then we also need gravel, plants, and soil. The gravel's for the bottom of it, and plants and soil to plant the plants. The building process. While the weather outside isn't always suitable to the outside, we try to do as much as we can inside. So far, so far we already bent holes and staked out the area. And this week we're planning on digging and laying down the weed area. Um, soon we will be planting gravel and starting building the um, Community, how will this help the community? We hope to contribute to the school's annual plant sale, um, as well as have food donations with the plant ground. It will also allow for a lot of community service opportunities with the students here um, and cross community opportunities with with Dr. Uh, the STEM connections. Some of the STEM connections are that knowing the construction process and how to build a greenhouse, using the tools and proper, properly using them and applying them in everyday life, uh, learning about the heredity of plants, how to get what plants to be a certain color, or even get a better gene out of a plant. Uh, the math connections are through measuring and cutting at the right points, and also bending the poles to a certain degree. And uh, agriculture and food science, so it's how to, it's, we're gonna learn how to grow plants, maintain them, and have them good for harvest. Uh, these are pictures of the process so far. These are pictures from our trip to Home Depot where we got a lot of the supplies we need. And here's us bending the poles. As you can see, we built it, we uh, secured it to one of the tables in Ms. Mason's room, and we have the uh, effort of teamwork here to keep the table down and straight while we pitch against the wall. <laughs> um, this was just yesterday, actually. We went outside to stake out the area, and we are going to start digging the paper tomorrow. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, I have a couple. How, what's the physical layout of your uh, greenhouse going to be? What are the dimensions? What are the dimensions? Oh, 10 by 20. 10 by 20, okay. Yes. I'm kind of intrigued with the bending of that of those poles. <laughs> I mean, how do you really do that? So, you first, it's a straight pole, you feed it in through here. There's a little uh, circle down here that holds it in. And you pretty much go on the end of it and push towards the, uh, push towards the table. And you want to try to keep it as more like a horizontal movement instead of going up and down to keep this pole as straight as you can. And as you keep going, it's a little harder. So they actually included a little uh, momentum bar to put inside the pole as it gets smaller. That, that great piece there, that's actually, that comes with the kit. That's what, that's what, that piece of equipment is. Yeah, I was going to so say, where the, yeah, that great thing, where yeah, that, that come that from? That comes with the kit to bend the pole, to bend the poles for the hoop house. So they're all the same. Wow. It's, it's, it's it, like as Logan talked about, it's that semicircle. So, I it, we've never built a greenhouse game. <laughs> like, this is a, a new journey for us as well. So, like, the 
that's that's from the website that we purchased it from. So we had to keep some straight, not bent. What's yes. The the poles in the middle are yeah. going to be straight. And then the ones we bent are the ones that will make the kind of the arc. Yeah. So how are you going to get water down there? Oh, there's actually, isn't there a watering? I'm not sure exactly what it is. We have a couple like of, there are a couple of things in process. Mr. Evans is on top of many of them. Uh, we've talked to Mr. Domzalski about maybe getting a, a water line out there. He feels like that could be pretty straightforward. We also, he has a, a huge, since 500 gallons now, mm -hmm. yeah. he's got a large reservoir from something else that we could collect water from the dugout in. So there's a water line out there that's not functional right now, but there is one that we use for the football field. So we're we're just going to run a trencher for one day and run one from that water line over. There was one by the fence, the baseball field, mm -hmm. that somehow is not functional. We're, we're just going to repipe it from where we hook up the football field and mm -hmm. PVC pipe it. And we're going to power down there. Buckets and community service <laughs> because they don't know they don't know it yet. But they're, the next process they're going to figure out in the fall is they're going to calculate the area inside so we figure out what size heater we need to put inside of it so we can use it during the winter. Right. So my question was, because at first you guys said softball field, you're meaning down near baseball. Yeah. Right? Oh. Yeah. Okay, because I was like, it's going to Bachi Park. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that makes sense. So do, does most of the group plan on carrying forward with the project in the succeeding years, successive years, in, in terms of launching it and your first crops and parts and things like that? Yes, we were planning on in our senior year, next year, coming in after school, or even on certain days uh, after school or even on the weekends to come in and help out with the greenhouse. So what's the timeline? Do you anticipate anything going to be um, grown this summer? Uh, this like, summer. What's the timeline of all this completion? Well, it really depends on the water right now, but we do, our hopes are by the end of the year we should have a greenhouse up and looking good. Okay, so nothing for this summer. It's too soon for this summer. Well, yes, almost. Mr. Irvin's going to teach him how to grow ranches in the fall. Okay. <laughs> teachers that are like, I'm really into composting. We need to get a compost down there and teach the science behind composting. And you can actually get hot water down there and serve hot cocoa, because if you put <laughs> copper piping in the compost, it's hot enough to be able to, you know, do that thing. And then there's like, I want, you know, Mr. Robinson's like, in a science food class where we can, you know, so like, teachers are really jumping in, community is really jumping in, like, kind of getting around this. So, could be some cool opportunities for, for future opportunities for kids here. So. There's enough ideas to fill a 30 by 90 uh, <laughs> hoop house right now, so we're going to have to slow some people down a little bit and let, let the students take control of this. <laughs> I just want to say, too, like, you guys are really leaving your legacy. You know, you're going to come back and see this structure that's pretty awesome. So thank you for what you're doing. Like, this is going to change. It was fun because when they, they did a lot of research and I went down initially and they had a lot of really unique things. And I kind of had to kind of steer them back because some of those unique things it wouldn't have been good for the long run because they would have been materials that would have been hard to find. They had some really kind of unique structures that would have been difficult to grow things in. It would have been kind of cool to look at, but then when you wanted to replace the plastic in three years, we would never be able to find it because it would have been, it would have been something to do. So they, they really did a whole lot of research on it and then kind of let me guide them back towards something a little bit more conventional. And they, and they were really good about it because they didn't give, they didn't get stuck on any one kind of concept and saying we got to have this and we got to have that and they were really open to it. It was a lot of fun and they had great questions and they, they continued to, to work hard on it and move it forward. So, great stuff. <laughs> Mr. Evans, do we want to dismiss the students now because their portion's done? Sure. Grab some pizza before we move Absolutely. on to the okay with everybody. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, students. Oh, the girls are speaking apart. I want to give a shout out to Mrs. Mason. We, we had prom promise yesterday, and Kelsey's in a second year of staff member here, 
And Prom Promise, if you've been around here long enough, is, is one of the biggest undertakings that we do in the spring. And she hit a home run yesterday with Prom Promise, and that's a huge undertaking for anybody, let alone a second year teacher here at Cog Heights. And I want to give her a shout out to the board while she's here. So great Aww. job, Kelsey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will say, I had, we were with three seniors last night, and it was impactful. So thank you. I was very happy with how the audience acted, how the uh, students participating acted. And like, the weather was beautiful. Like, it was, everything came together yesterday, and the kids were talking about it today as well. So I feel like the best was good. Yeah. Hopefully, they'll take that with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a lovely prom this weekend. Yeah. There's way less people. Do you guys have to vote before I talk? Or no. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Ed would ask me early in the year to come talk to you guys in the spring about, because it's a new position, to talk about kind of what we're doing through the MTSS office, what that work has looked like this year, what the future looks like. Uh, my first bullet point is a greenhouse project. <laughs> okay. Like that, the, I hate talking about people when they're here and I want everybody to blush. Um, Mr. Evans alluded to this in kind of his comments at the end. That was super student-led. So we threw a throwing problem at them and kind of walked away. Um, the thing they didn't mention is we tied that to class performance. Um, so it's uh, that's the geometry class for folks who don't love math. Um, so it moves at a slightly slower pace. Um, there's more frequent assessments. Uh, it's a co-talk class, and it's uh, a lot of staff in that room for fewer students. I only pop in one day a week. We're going through. Um, so, but the, the nature of that class is that they teach one or two uh, geometry skills a week, assess on Thursday, and then the greenhouse project happens on Friday. Uh, the nice part about that system, like all of this is really tied to the MTSS stuff. It's, um, it's kind of like a little encapsulation of the stuff that we're trying to do. Um, if you didn't perform well on the quiz on Thursday, you get remediation and an opportunity to reassess on Friday. So from a student perspective, they think of it in a, a negative way. Like, if I don't perform well on this, I can't do the fun greenhouse stuff on Friday. But for us, it's like, mm, it's backwards. You get to prove to us that you've mastered the skill, and if you don't, we have the opportunity to reteach it in a much, you know, because most students were successful on the quiz, so we're reteaching the two or three or four people, and we're giving an immediate opportunity to show us what they know, which is really nice. So it's incentivizing, but it also, like, a bunch of the stuff I want to talk about tonight, there's, like, carrots for everybody. So it's carrots for the kids because we get to go to the greenhouse, but it's carrots for the staff because we get to teach stuff more than once. Um, it, I was viewing the greenhouse project largely as a pilot for more project-based learning stuff. Um, another project-based learning thing we did this year that didn't make it in my notes um, was a tiny book library through the middle school, um, which I'm excited about, but I, the pictures aren't as nice and no kids will talk about it. <laughs> but the greenhouse project is really kind of that project-based learning idea, a way to engage students who can occasionally be disengaged with the curriculum. You guys can teach it, you remember it, right? Science, coastal, intelligence. You know, so it's a way to get those kids hooked in and a way for us to kind of squeeze more juice out of the orange. Do you want me to stop after each bullet? Okay, no, I'm just gonna keep going. Hey, why are you so mad? You should say, don't sit next to me. It's always in my, yeah. I'm not gonna try and make eye contact. <laughs> um, you are responsible. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so uh, I, here's what I did. I just tried to break down the, the larger things that the MTS office did this year. It's just me, but I don't like saying I over and over. So I'll say we or the MTS office. Uh, I think the largest work that we did this year is pilot implementation of team intervention, team intervention procedures. Um, it's not really something that we've had in the district before. Um, this doesn't work. Sorry. Hey Dave, could you click that link for me? I'm only going to be there for a second, though. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Can I uh, give you access? Can I share it with you guys? I'll share it. I'm sorry. I was rolling. I can feel Tom's, like, chill out vibes. Yeah, you're, you're good. Like, you're every... just having a conversation. I gave you a... Oh, OK. Um, so I think that one of the best things about Kyle Heights is that we have a phenomenal staff who's invested in the success of our students, and we do things that make sense. That's also one of the things about that occasionally doesn't work, is that we don't have as many processes as you might expect in a larger place. So the team intervention form and the team intervention process, it's a way to take the things that we're doing and try and system test them. Try and get them a little bit more uniform so we're providing the supports to everybody who needs them. And it, it, um, I think back to my role as a special education teacher in the district, and I found problems and solved them. Like if there were kids in my class who were struggling, I, really I, I did the things that I needed to do. 
That's a flawed system because it relies so heavily <coughs> on people's mind and things. So I, I, I feel like I've talked about this in the interview, but I don't know who is there. One of the things that I think the MTSS office has to do is, is systematize those things, is to make them more perceived. So that we're doing the same things that we do, which is providing service to students through exceptional teaching, but we're doing it in a way where we don't miss it. Because we're doing it more systematically, we have many uh, kind of on-ramps to service, and we're doing it more intentionally. Um, this is just my form. I just wrote like my form. <laughs> so we had um, we ran 45-ish, 45. We had 43 students who were referred for team intervention. That was just teachers who fell out of form. Um, then that kicked in. What the grades year. are you talking about here? Sorry, six and twelve. Okay. Um, it, yeah, six and twelve. I'll never talk about fifth grade. They're too small. They're too big. <laughs> but, so just six through twelve, we had 43 students who were referred by teachers for team intervention. What that looks like is I, I do a bunch of, I populate this with a bunch of information. Like, what have we done in the past? What has worked? What are some suggestions from literature base that could be useful for the students to push forward? And then what are we going to do? Newly proposed interventions, who's going to be responsible, who's going to monitor, where do we go? Um, that kind of, did. could you go back to the, I'm really sorry, could you go back to the slides? And then this is weird, could you scooch down to the one that's colored? Like, you got to go like three down, three more slides. Yeah, that's the guy. Oh, no. Yeah, that's the guy. Um, <laughs> So you got like, Mr. Sugar, I know that you've seen the pyramid a billion times, but Tom kind of thought that it might be beneficial to talk through just the different tiers of service. So MTSS is multi-tiered systems of support, right? All of these models, like response to intervention, um, positive behavior intervention systems, and MTSS follow kind of this three-tiered model, right? Um, this is mine because I think the triangle isn't enough <laughs> information. So the things that we crush here, we have a beautiful and robust tier one. So this is high quality classroom instruction and everything that we give to everybody. The things that we're doing inside of all of our general education classes that are leading us to academic success. There are some students who need more support. This is why I have this mostly new tier two. This is one of the biggest things that we did through that team intervention process was provide like more intentional and systematic interventions for kids who needed more. Um, but that's not the only way to get there, right? We have universal screening, which I'll talk about in the next bullet point. Um, we have academic failure, which I'll talk about in the third bullet point. Oh, I'll give you the best. Um, persistent discipline referrals, which I'll refer to Mr. Burke. Good Because um, he's not here, so I can just keep moving. Um, attendance, less than 80%. Um, we have a couple of kids who've had a difficult time getting here, uh, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. And then teacher referrals, the last arrow. All of these are different avenues into more systematized tier two service. Tier two service is additional stuff. It's more stuff. <laughs> like, it's intervention driven by the literature base, provided by a highly, uh, a highly skilled professional to, to close gaps. Um, I think of a lot of this stuff through the math curriculum because it's where I've spent most of my career. But if, uh, if Mr. Martin has a kid who can't graph a parabola, it's possible that that's because they missed linear program or uh, linear equations. So if you can work that back, reteach that skill, and then come forward, that's a tier two intervention. We're not suggesting that Mr. Martin should stop teaching parabolas. We're saying, no, we've got to go back and teach this kid a thing that we missed. Or we have to provide him a skill, or we have to give him some intentional studies. We have to do something to help this kid be more successful in parabolas, in addition to all of the great stuff that Mr. Martin's doing in his classroom. Um, a lot of kids are just going to kick back to tier one. Like, we're going to be for four weeks and autograph a line, I don't know how to graph a parabola. Goodbye. I'll see you at graduation. Um, so, time and attention, a lot of kids are going just back to the green. Some kids, that's not going to work for us in that system tier three. So, the, all the way back. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, all the way back to that pilot implementation of team intervention procedures, that's one arrow to get kids into that yellow uh, batch of service. Uh, we saw 43 kids. Um, I did not want to get into like, granular stuff. I kind of wanted to go like helicopter view. Um, we had some success with some kids. We had some kids who just hung around. Um, I'm bad at kicking kids out, so I kind of accumulate students like dust on the suit coat. Um, I never get them back to the green. I'm worried that if I close the umbrella, they'll get wet again. Um, we're going to continue that in the 22-23 school year. I want more teachers to use it, um, and I want us to do a better job of providing more different and interesting service. Uh, the thing that Mr. Young kind of cautioned me about as we moved into this was there have to be more things than like I do some additional teaching. So like things like the tutoring program, things like the, I'll get to the failure prevention at the end, but providing students with more instruction is tricky because everybody has jobs. Um, but that's the stuff that we have to continue to do in 22 and 23. Pilot implementation, team intervention. Bullet point three, sixth grade screener. It's an exciting one. Um, this is a, an old one that's in the summer. Mr. Jerry, I remember he's excited about it. Um, this is not the number of sixth graders we have. I don't know that number. It's in the low 50s. But we have 47 incoming sixth graders, so this year's current sixth graders. We got into the building into the summer to do an evidence-based reading screener and evidence-based math screener. 
Um, the idea here, it's it's the same I Oh no. Dave, I hit B. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Don't hit B. It feels like down should move down. Um, but universal screening is another way that we get students into tier two service. The idea behind universal screening is it's universal. We're asking everybody to do an academic test to kind of or a social emotional learning test to kind of show us that this is a thing that they can do. Um, uh, there are kids that we miss because they work hard, because they have a lot of parent support, or because they've figured out good ways to fake it. Um, a universal screener kind of takes out that component. Um, I, I, I'm not going to give you something to have you do it at home if you're in front of me. <laughs> if you're in front of me, I buy it. <laughs> if you can, but I don't. Um, so the universal screening is a huge part of what we do. This is a weird thing about a 6 through 12 MTSS position. If you think about universal screening at the elementary school level, that's such pretty straightforward. Like, you know, you run kids through, again, I, just people getting a shooter, which is education. <laughs> but you know, if you have kids reading every three weeks, and if they're doing better, they're doing better. But once we get over here, we're not teaching kids reading. We're teaching them, they're using those reading skills to learn new things. So these screeners, like we don't have to deploy them as frequently, but we do still have to deploy them because we have kids in the ninth grade who still can't read. So here, we're catching them in the sixth grade. Um, I think we had like seven kids who, who backed out. There was one parent of a gifted kid who said, I'm pretty sure we're kicking there were a couple of people who were out of town. You mean out, like, you have to get permission to do the screener? So I, I always ask, I never tell people. So what I did was I sent out, I communicated with parents in a bunch of different ways. I sent out an email, I sent out a paper letter in the mail, um, and then I got a lot of responses because of Kaya Guides. But for people who I didn't get responses from, I followed up with a phone call. Um, I would, I, I can get all that stuff to you oh, in I terms just, of what you contact, curious. but I never told parents that they had to do this. I didn't tell parents this was something that we were requiring, because I didn't know the capacity to do that, quite honestly. I don't, this is the first time I've worn a necktie all year. Um, and I also think that these kinds of things are always better when they're voluntary. Mm -hmm. um, all of this stuff, um, like particularly when we get to the failure prevention thing, like all of this stuff is I am making suggestions and they're good. So people are like, that sounds good. But yeah, I did have I did have one parent who didn't want to come in because they didn't kid could read. I had a couple of kids on vacation. I think I did have one or two people who I just didn't contact. Like and I, they it worked out. The, the one or two phone calls I got, I said, you need to understand this is a new right. program. We're trying to get a baseline on every kid. So this isn't. We're we're implementing a new program, and he. Had, Mr. Fried wasn't even in the program two weeks and he had already had letters sent out to everybody. I said, we're trying to just get some baseline information on all the kids coming in so we, we have some information to start with. And once, I think I handled one or two of those calls and once they said, oh, okay, we, because they didn't, they saw MTSS, they had no idea what it was, they didn't know it, you know, so. And that, there was a description of that in the last paragraph of the letter, which yeah. was bad job Well, but, no, not bad job by you, but it, it, sometimes that's typical of a parent. It's summer, they read the first two paragraphs. I'm not taking my kid in for a test in July. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, that's. I do feel like our success rate is pretty solid. Um, and I, like, to Mr. Evans' point about the summer thing, like, yeah, it was, it was summer. Uh, I feel like we're going too soon. <laughs> What's my fault? I'm going to start talking faster. These are jokes. Not possible. I know. So we had 47 kids come in. Um, we trained staff on the screener. Uh, the reading screener was one-on-one. -on -one. So it was, um, it's from the people who make Dibbles, but it's a Dibbles offshoot. Um, so they did, uh, they read two passages, they retold the passages, they answered some comprehension questions. The math screener was administered in groups. Um, it was calculation group, uh, and there was a problem solving component. Um, from that, we identified students who were likely to need some extra support. Uh, this is the work that we have to do better in the next school year. Is like we, there's like the, the funny MTSS catchphrase is like, if you screen, you must have been. <laughs> so we did a great job screening, and then we did a great job of kind of communicating those results. But then again, it's the, it's the follow up. It's like, what are the what are the things in place that we have to support those students who, who haven't mastered reading or, or decoding or, or computation skills? And that's work that I think we need to do better on this year. But we're going to continue the sixth grade screener for this year. Um, the, there's an aggressive proposal from my office to get done during the school year, and if we don't, we'll do it in the summer again. Um, I also think that there was a real benefit to having kids come in. It was fun. Like, the people, the, the staff that we had in the building were like fun and interesting and engaging and like wanted to do this with students. So it was a nice way in my brain to introduce them to middle school as well. Um, eventually, we want to widen that to the ninth grade. Um, none of the MTS literature that I've read suggests that you should be screening like as frequently at the sixth or twelve level as you at the elementary school level. So if we catch all our kids in the sixth grade and we catch all our kids again in the ninth grade, I, I would submit to you that that's enough screening for us. I, I think that that does get into an idea of like too much stuff if we're doing this three years in the middle school. So that was a sixth grade screener. Okay. 
Now, the failure prevention project is, is uh, I'm super excited about this one. So, uh, as the third quarter is wrapping up, um, we identified students who either had a semester average of an F or a third quarter F, or were in some other way at risk of failing an academic class for the year. That was the first component, is who's, who's going to fail something. Um, the second component was who is likely to benefit from targeted reteaching of critical content in that area where they, were, they had the potential to fail. Um, <laughs> I, again, I, I'm not in love with, I have to tell you what I did, but it sounds like my grandmother would tell me to stop bragging. <laughs> so I just, I'm not in love with the next sentence, but I don't have another way to phrase it. I talked to my wife about it, she said it was fine. I'm going to move on to time. Um, so the first thing I did was I compiled just all of those kids who had a first semester average of an F for third quarter Fs, but I knew there were kids that I missed. So I talked to every teacher in the building, and I talked to like John Schaefer, and I said, John, are you going to have anybody fail this year? He said, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so, but the, the reason that I wanted to talk to everybody is because I didn't want to miss anybody, and I also feel like for things like this that are brand new, um, to, I'm not going to show you the pyramid again, but this is stuff that we're building like in the moment. Like this is stuff that hasn't really existed here before. So I wanted to make sure that everybody in the building knew what we were doing. Um, so I, and I actually did get a couple of kids who I had missed. Like there were a couple of D minus four floaters out there. Um, so the, the thing, the, the pitch to teachers was that there are students who are at risk of failing an academic class for the year would fall into roughly three categories. Some kids saved the bacon. Like some kids had a great third quarter and there was great book lag or they did something or there was something that I wasn't aware of and they made it great. Those kids are green. Um, there were some kids who flew the pirate flag for 27 weeks and we probably should have jumped in at week nine instead of week 27. There were some kids who, this is the, I see Tom going like this, but <laughs> some kids you, you can't fail. Like our, our efforts, our, it's incumbent on us to provide students with as many tools and resources and instructions as possible for them to not fail, but I think some kids can fail. There were some kids who were not going to benefit from this targeted reteaching because they missed too much, because they hadn't done a lick of homework all year, because they never made up a test because they were in poor by or something. There were some kids for whom this didn't apply. But the yellow kids, they were yellow in my initial spreadsheet, which I didn't show. <laughs> but the yellow kids were kids who missed something critical that they needed in the future that we could reteach them through extra instruction. Uh, this is another, like, lots of carrots. Um, I'll use Mr. Martin as my example again, because he's the person I think of the most. Just all the time. What do you think about Mr. Martin right now? So, like, for Al, Al had, I think he had four students in Alpha 2 who were at risk of failing that class for the year. I'm allowed to say that out right? Okay, cool. You guys just did anyway. Work. You can find out. <laughs> Too late. Retract it. <laughs> so the conversation that he and I had was what did those things miss and what could he reteach and what could he reassess so that he knew that they knew enough stuff to pass up for two for you. Um, he was really excited about that idea. He had those four kids. He brought them in for four Mondays. He retaught four units. He just went back and found their lowest test scores. We taught that in a one on four situation instead of a one on 25 in 90 minutes instead of over two weeks and only the most critical content. Right? So he's taking, he's using his immense professional judgment and capacity to teach to get these kids to the things that they absolutely missed. Those kids aren't going to fail this year. Like those are kids who we would have in summer school would have to repeat, but because we gave Mr. Martin an opportunity to, to say, yeah, there's stuff that they need. They need it in pre-calc, they need it in college, they need it in life. I can teach that to them. That's the carrot for him, is that, is that you know, our summer school program's online. It's great, kids get credit, but it's not Al Martin teaching 90 minutes one and four. So that's, that was this failure prevention thing. We did it, uh, we had 18 students across six content areas. Uh, I grabbed three kids from physical science, and it was great. Um, it's this thing where there's students who are maybe traditionally disengaged from the curriculum, who aren't buying what we're selling. But if you say to those kids, like, I'm, I'm going home at 4.30 today too. Like, I'm staying here because you need to know this stuff. It was some of the best instruction I've done in some time. Like, they learned a bunch of stuff, and it didn't suck. Like, for any of us. Um, it's a thing that I think that we've done through the NCSS process that's the most exciting because it starts to reframe the conversation around grades from what has a student done to what have they mastered. Um, I, I'm okay to talk about criteria for acceptable performance, right? I don't remember if you told me to leave that out. Okay. Just say keep it in. So one idea in the NCSS literature is criteria for acceptable performance. If you keep, just keep it in the algebra 2 class, right? Maybe Al is 18 standards. Those are not all equivalent really importance. And he knows that, and we know that. He still has to teach everything. It's in his curriculum. But there are some things that if you get too great, if you don't, that's okay. Not everybody needs to be in circle. Everybody needs to be able to solve a system of equations. That's okay. Criteria for acceptable performance kind of acknowledges that idea and says students need to master these core components to be successful in the next class or to be successful in college or to be successful in life. If 
we can get teachers to identify those, that clarifies for us what it means for a student to pass. So this was almost the first step on that. It's like, did this, in the physical science class, I retaught, um, I retaught uh, balancing chemical equations, and I retaught a bunch of isotope stuff, which they need to be successful in biology. Mr. Patterson knows that because he knows the sequence. He understands what they need next. So if those kids didn't get that, they're going to have a hard time in biology. So it's starting to, it's starting to kind of move the, it's, it's moving us away from, I spent a lot of time in my special education life giving kids 61.5%. It's shifting away from that and shifting over to, no, 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 you don't know what a parabola is, man. We're going to reteach that. We're not just going to have you do a bunch of a backlog of work. Um, so the failure prevention project, I think, was really exciting. My computer was asleep because I talked to you. I changed my password recently. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Next bullet point? Right. Thanks, Dave. I'm just going to keep saying thanks to Dave. <laughs> um, I feel like those... Oh, I didn't... I got it. I understand what's happening. So the, the students that you're referring to, the student population, again, it's 6 through 12? Yes, sir. It's 9 through 12. The failure prevention program we only piloted at the high school level. 9 through 12. Right. And that one for me was... That was... I feel like that was because I wanted to see if it worked. Um, I spent most of my instructional life here at the high school level. Um, I know the high school curriculum a little bit better. I, I did not, this is another space to circle back to what Ms. Shrieker was saying. I didn't tell anybody they had to do this. So I went and pitched this idea to teachers. Um, I felt like I had a better capacity to do that in 9 through 12, and the stakes are higher. You know, if, you, yeah. if you don't pass that's out, the, two that's the key. That's, the yeah, that's a long time conversation. Brian, it goes back to Brian and I had when I was principal. And, the middle school conversation with intervention specialists is when you get to ninth grade, you're playing for keeps because mm -hmm. credits mean graduation. Yes, right. So, right. that's why we're saying yeah. it was a targeted yeah. program, six to for sure. Nine to four. Yeah. yeah, and like the other thing on that, and like I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that because I, the dream next year is to expand it. I'd like to expand it down, but I'd also like to shorten. Six to twelve next year. Yeah, because okay. it's the same stuff, and it also it starts to. Like it acknowledges that there are component skills that kids that we have to teach kids at some point, or they're just constantly going to be behind. Um, the stick, like it's a lot of carrots, because for the kid, oh, and what we told kids is if you show up, you master content, and you pass the fourth quarter, you'll pass the class. If your quality points don't sort out, we're, we're, you've done the work. We know you passed the class. You'll get a D minus. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, widening, right? My dream is for that to happen quarterly. So if you get a first quarter F, we're kicking into after school remediation so, so that we're not playing catch up at the end of the year. So that then we don't have as many kids flying the pirate flag for quite as long. Um, the, the other part about that is that it is a little bit of a stick. As much as it's fun to hang out with me for 90 minutes, it sucks when the sun's out. So as students start to understand that this is a thing that we're doing, like I got, it, it becomes an incentive for mastering curriculum the first time. Uh, another thing about like those tiers, oops, like the reason they universally screen is because kids in the yellow, so some phrasing around kids in that yellow, that mostly tier two, is kids who can but aren't, right? The, the red kids are kids who perhaps can't. Like there is gonna be a small, tiny fraction of our students who never mess with math, right? never learn how to read. The vast majority of them can but aren't. So those tier two services are bridging that gap. Why, why aren't you doing this, buddy? Did you miss something? Do you, do you have no time management? What is it? So that we can kind of close that gap, and that's this idea. Like, the, we're saying the vast majority of our students can do this stuff if we shorten the cycle that we're allowing them to not do it. So if you if you miss lines the first time in seventh grade, you don't have lines in ninth grade. We should have prevented that failure much earlier. So that's the that's the that's the that's the dream expansion is both down to six, but then also shortening the cycle. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully we get less kids. We have the most kids in the first quarter, and then the fewest the fourth. Is a dream. Um, but I'll talk to you guys about that in three or six days. Oh no, I keep wanting this to... <laughs> okay, as long as I don't change slides, I'm good. This is a tiny one. We did some Windows EOC prep. Another way that I think the MTSS position can work here, um, as opposed to at a larger place, is that it's a perfect office to do things that are just a little unexpected or a little weird. We have a huge, you know, it's a huge amount of work that we do to prepare students for the end of course exams in the spring, but it's far fewer students in the winter, and it's more difficult to kind of build a coherent plan when it's two kids taking geometry, two kids taking English two, one kid taking biology. Um, so we coordinated the winter EOC test prep. Um, we coordinated efforts for 13 kids across five winter and course exams. 
And Mr. Jantz and I did some winter break instruction. He did some biology and I did some algebra too. Uh, results were patchy. Kids taking it in the winter are often kids who are taking it because they struggled the first time. Um, but I would submit to you that we got a couple of kids to get a couple more points that they maybe wouldn't have in the absence of that. Um, graduation assurance efforts has become a big part of my life here in the fourth quarter. Um, we always have a couple of seniors who are kind of dragging across the finish line. Um, there have been times in the past when we've outsourced that to some of our professors in Maritime, but that's kind of come into the MTSS office. Um, I'll let you know in two weeks if we made it. <laughs> Continued implementation of Freshman Foundations program. Uh, this is the thing that I'm most excited about. Um, I feel like I've said that about three or four bullet points, so at least one of them is a lot. Um, but the Freshman Foundations program, you guys might remember that grant that we got when Ted was Matt. We had that large, um, it was innovative programming for transition planning. Did I get it right now? Do you remember what it was called? Something like that. Tom's checking. Yeah, I've been talking to him. Did you put me on a timer? You're way over. So don't even, yeah. I told my yeah. wife I was talking for 13 okay. minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have a talk. so interested. I'm, uh, I'm going to call Natasha and tell her that she needs to buy a new watch. So um, we wrote a grant. We got a bunch of money. That's when we put in the Freshman Foundation program. The first cohort of seventh graders are this year's seniors. Um, so what it is, it's a class. It's a class for credit. Um, I've taught it every year but one. I think Beth Pavick had it one year. Um, it's... In some ways, it looks like a traditional kind of special education study lab in that we're supporting students' academic growth. It's a lot of, here's what's on the horizon, here's a test, here's how you prepare for a test, here's how you balance a chemical equation. It's a lot of reteaching, pre-teaching, it's a lot of that kind of remediation. There's a huge academic component. Um, but it's students who do not receive special education services necessarily. We oftentimes have students with special education in the class, but it's just students who are identified for a variety of reasons in the eighth grade of having the potential for having academic difficulty in school. So one big chunk we do is academic support, making sure that they're passing classes. Another big thing that we do, it's the reason we got the grant from Ohio, where else would we get it from, um, is transition planning. So it's special education style have a transition planning for kids who didn't get it otherwise. We do a bunch of stuff to talk about what's next. Um, for kids who are disengaged, like this is a population of kids who are, we know are going to have a difficult time making it to the finish line, so it's providing intentional additional tier two service on the front end. Um, but it's like, we didn't go this year, we didn't go last year because of the pandemic, but we get out of the building a lot. Um, we go at least one college visit, we do some community service, we go to, we've had some uh, people who work come in to talk, but it's like, hey, the reason high school is important is because it prepares you for what's next. Like, if you want to go work, that's great. You still have to graduate. If you want to go to college, that's great. Here's what one looks like. Here's how you can get there. So it's building in those transition things to keep students motivated. Um, sometimes kids don't understand what ninth grade is for. Sometimes I don't either. But if you see the end, it's much easier to get to it. Um, so that's really what Freshman Foundations is about. That's now kind of wholly under the MTSS umbrella, which is nice. These are my two favorite graphs. Um, this is, no. <laughs> this is every kid. Um, Johnny Roy yells at me because it looks like spaghetti. Um, but the dark blue line is the, it's just the average. So this is a core academic GPA. So just the big four for me, English, math, science, and social studies. I care about art, but not here. Um, this is a eighth grade final. So the kids, like we're sub 2.0 here. We get a huge spike when they get into ninth grade and then a little dip because the honeymoon's over. But we have this large, uh, like they just keep growing, which is nice, which makes sense because we're providing tier two support. There are kids who can, but aren't. Um, some of this is Pando related, some of this is the junior year wall, um, but they never get back to down here. So we always have kids above where they started on average, which is nice. We got a couple of kids floating with 4.0s. We had a couple of Pando 0.0s. Don't tell anybody. Keep quiet. Um, wait, I just told you. Um, this is this year's cohort. Again, you can't see that. <laughs> this is this year's cohort. Um, the blue line, again, is an average, the light blue line for every kid. Uh, nice, nice upward curve here. It's just making me happy. Uh, by the end of fourth quarter, we'll be at like 2.3. Um, so these are kids who are improving academically. Uh, they're improving attendance. I think I'm probably down on suspension numbers that group, but I have to count. Um, so overall, like the Freshman Foundation Program, it's a thing that I, I would submit to you. We can widen in some way, um, but that's probably a conversation for them. Um, I'm almost done. <laughs> well, you are scheduled for a sophomore strategies, so those kids will continue. Thanks. Sophomore strategies is the second part of the grad study. Um, graduation plan support, uh, that's new state law, that's kind of the MTSS office collaborating with the guidance office. That's the place where I'm doing the transition plan for everybody. Um, social emotional instruction at the sixth grade level, it's super exciting. Um, we have a new rotation.
rotation in the specials. Is that right? Specials? Specials. It's an intro to communication class that the new English teacher, Sheila Hopkins, is teaching. Um, I, she and I connected early on. That's a space where it's brand new, but who knows what it is. They're doing speeches. So it's a perfect place for me to push in and sneak in some of this SEL stuff. Uh, Rachel Matthew, the district social worker, and I are going every Wednesday to do like intentional instruction around social emotional outcomes, uh, resilience, teamwork, goal setting, organization, just a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm thinking of that as a pilot for those kinds of push-in services as well. Um, that's the thing that could, again will widen in the future. Um, at a bare minimum, every sixth grader knows what are like evidence-based characteristics of effective teams. They know what good goals are. Um, we've had exposure to this kind of stuff that we really haven't done. Like, it's another intentionality. Thing. It's not a thing that we've done on purpose in the past. Um, and then the last one is the least interesting one because I don't have a lot to say. But uh, part of the pitch for this initial position was institutional research. Uh, Mr. Young's got the National Clearinghouse data that's going through outside consultant to get cleaned up. And I also have some long-term patterns of grading practice analysis that's still in the oven. Um, but I didn't want it to kind of look like that because I feel like the spreadsheets are 30% off. So. Mm -hmm. Questions? That's a lot. It's been a busy year for Brian. I, have, I love though your passion, like your passion for this. Like this like, could be like not really exciting stuff to talk about or to do, but it's so needed and so necessary, and you are affecting like lives in a good way. So I really appreciate thank that. Thank you for right. the positivity and the. I mean, I think your energy is is very. It's good, especially when you're talking about at risk kids. I appreciate you need that. So thank you. I think like it's exciting because it's this whole new thing. Like I feel like I. I I talked to Tom early. I feel like Tom asked me to talk to the board in, in November and told him I was going to be selling cars in two weeks, so I couldn't do it. Um, but like, there's like this excitement of building something brand new, and then like this white hot terror. But enough things have worked this year that I think we should keep doing. I mean, you've had, thank you have you have so much passion and energy. Is is this too much for one person? To no, do? no, 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 no. Yes, I wasn't sure where that question was going, so I said no before the question. <laughs> um, I think that like. I think that the critical thing, and this is the thing that I've come to understand this year, is that the provision of service can't just be one person, which I, I don't think I ever actually mentioned that in the, the failure prevention effort. I'm only doing one of those. So we have five content areas and I got other people to teach. Um, the thing that I need to do pushing forward is, is kind of rely on a more diverse network of service providers. Like we have so much talent in the building and people generally say yes to it. So in terms of providing that extra instruction, they just do, just because like Tom knows. Like I, Tom knows that people say this. They're <laughs> <Can't imagine why. laughs> but it's like this, it's like this thing that like, like the, the failure prevention is, is like a, a really good example because it's, it's like, I did not, I didn't have the capacity to teach all those things. There's more people here. Um, so offloading sure. some of that instruction stuff, I think, it, I think is critical, like moving mm -hmm. forward. I think like this stuff, like the, the helicopter stuff, I don't know, there's some days I feel like I should be doing more things. Um, but I think that it's like, it's the student facing stuff that I think I do have to offer. Mm -hmm. So yes and no. And that was a discussion with Brian going into this because as soon as we had this, this when we were talking this time last year and, and Mike was just kind of turning Brian loose and, and it was like there was 10,000 wires that were just flying around out here because Brian had all these ideas, and, and quite honestly, when he said, I'm going to get every sixth grader in this summer to test, and I thought, yeah, sure you are. Uh, you know, but I, I didn't want to squelch any, any, any of the ideas that he had. But, and Brian does a great job of, I just kind of step back and say, what do you need from me, and, and get out of his way. And he tends to make things happen and gets people involved where he needs to get people involved in it. And 99.9% it, it, and .9 of the time it works out the way we need it to, because people do. People are willing to step in because... They, they know, like a lot of things we do around here, the end result is that it's good for kids. So, you know, very, very infrequently does somebody say, no, I'm not going to do that or I don't, or I don't want to do that for you. So, um, you know, that that's why. And, and that's some of the power of this fall school because we'll have a conversation, like, you know, in some of those team intervention meetings are some of the most powerful conversations we've had. And they're challenging conversations. And Brian's passion kind of alleviates some of that you know, that tension that's in there because hard questions are asked, like what has been done for this kid? What are you doing? How are we trying to improve that tier one? But sometimes after the team leaves, it's just a few of us that are sitting there and we brainstorm something and from that comes, well, maybe next year we could do this. And then it's Brian's like, well, if we try to do this, or we move this and we can make stuff happen quickly because 
all right, we talked about it, now we can make sure that Matt Young is on board with his thing, and then we can talk to the teachers, and by the end of the week, sometimes we can get a plan, get things actionable, and then Brian's off and running with it, so it's, it's really good. And this isn't Brian running around being the idea guy for everybody else doing the work. Brian's doing a good part of the work as well, so I think people are, are far more respectful to know that Brian's rolling up his sleeves and doing the work right alongside of him, too, so that, I mean, when, you, when you're willing to do that, people are willing to jump in and do it with you, so. That's exactly what I was thinking. Fix it very well. Um, and so you talked about some of the areas where it's going to expand, and I know we've had some discussion about even taking it to the um, younger uh, levels as well. What's your thoughts on that, and how successful that would be, and where would that where would that benchmark? I'm going to interrupt here because <laughs> one of the reasons that we did it here is because look, tier one intervention is somewhat clearly defined. Intervention in the elementary is, is far more clearly defined. So they've entered interventions, tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions are, are far more clearly defined in the elementary building. They're much foggier on this level. Mike knows them 10 times better than I do because of, at, at, with his middle school experience and his experiences. One of the reasons that it was so critical that we get MTSS started here is because interventions have become a lot cloudier here. And this was a, this was a way for us to clarify that. So it was, it was more needed here at this point in time because they have interventions in place. This now kind of trickles back that way and, and I think there ends up being a logical progression but I think they end up working themselves together at some point in time here. There are interventions. They got tier one, uh, some tier two in place over there. I, we need some more work over there but they, they, they've already got a solid foundation in place over here. We were we were, we were on much shakier ground here. What was being done over here was being done individually, and that was a lot by our intervention specialists in the large core. This, this is the first time we're on solid ground as far as, as far as that pyramid that you see in place, and that's, we're, we're just in a really good place, but it'll, it'll work its way back right there, and I, you know. Can I add to, so sure. it's, it's super, I think one of the key differences too, just being in education is in grades six through 12, it's, piecemeal because you have nine different teachers maybe or whatever six plus teachers in the elementary you have a team of teachers and so that's where a lot of just of those tier two they're happening automatically amongst your team that's true you know every day so it, i mean that that makes a lot of sense that you would focus on a lot of ways and that was one of the challenges of why when when i first came here because last district i came from it had a really strong rti rti is really mts is really what response to interventions come here Boston intervention is really a multi-tiered system to support the you know, <coughs> elementary level. It's, it's pretty clearly defined. The ultimate goal is to identify students that have deficiencies in reading and mathematics that don't necessarily have a reading disability. Is there is there a deficiency in decoding? Is there a deficiency in fluency? Is there a deficiency in comprehension? And then based off of that, whether you use the universal screener, or whether you use the records of the educators, you, you have a pretty scripted intervention plan that is responsible for closing the gap. You benchmark, and you can see students just as a chart there, progress, you know, making their progress through. So pretty much closes the gap. And I lived that for all my years in, in my other districts. And I'm like, why isn't there anything from the high school? And, and you look at, and there's just there isn't because it's the same. The expectation is, and that's why we felt so strongly about the sixth grade screener is because the expectation is when kids come to sixth grade. They have the fluency, they have the decoding, and they have the comprehension skills, but the reality is it's not always necessarily there. So we're working under the assumption that when kids cross the parking lot, they're fluent readers and they're able to comprehend, and we start moving forward. And if we start moving forward with the content and the skills and the curriculum, and they don't have those foundational skills, they keep getting further and further apart, so that provides us the time to, to intervene. So we had to be creative, and that's where some of our some of our conversations and, and some of the things Brian comes up with are we're like, no way is this going to work. And then you start processing, you know, like, does it help kids? Does it, does it, you know, provide learning? And that's, that's the big key that, that we have with this. So. And we use a lot of universal screeners in the elementary building. Yeah, we've seen some of the software. There's a lot of universal screeners. And the other part is, as Mike said, they're working in teams over there. So that team time, here they're going from teacher to teacher to teacher. And, 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 and even from that regard, sometimes there's, there's some gaps. A student that might be, uh, a real strong math student is, is not a, a real good social studies or a real good English student and, and a lot of times those teachers they're not having a regular team meetings that, that they don't even realize that sometimes and <coughs> until they get into maybe some group meetings on that so it's it's a it's a it's a little bit different setup and 
I think back when we had when, when Mike was a middle school teacher, when we had some common planning time, I thought I think we caught some more of that stuff back then. But uh, um, I, or this is a work towards some of that, though. Uh, this is uh, just a, a great start to the first year, and I so. We we'll look forward to next year's presentation. Shot <laughs> <laughs> it down on my calendar. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. I am going to skip the five years. Okay. <laughs> and I obviously didn't, and, and I quite obviously didn't give Mrs. Mead the correct time for the start of the meeting tonight. As I, as I see Pam come in at seven, if he started six, I and I, it, it, I, I, I'm not sitting close to the window, so Mr. Mucci can, Muccio can push me out because I'm, I'm cutting in on his five-year forecast. So if it's all okay with the board, Pam, are you ready to give your? Yeah, I'm sorry, no, I didn't that no. no, that's fine. I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll be very, very quick. Okay. I see you brought emotional support for yourself well, here, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, this is my food service presentation. We have a great team. And we all keep up with our professional standards and, of course, pass all of our inspections. We definitely increased production due to federal waivers. And because of that, we did purchase new equipment for the elementary and middle high school kitchens. Um, we started off the year with professional development. Masonic Partners came in to work with our department to help with the latest trends, policy, and new menu items. Pamela Mead received a scholarship from Institute of Child Nutrition to attend a training event held in National Tennessee. Uh, the topics were managing personalities, training culturally diverse groups, and basic foundations for training. It was super cool. Mm -hmm. um, what did I do? Oh, okay. We, um, we have a lot of accomplishments. We have provided free lunch to all students this year as part of the federal waiver program. We provided meals for various occasions such as professional development, orientations, and events. We served over 27,863 lunches at the elementary building as of March 31st. Mm -hmm. We served over 41,106 lunches at the middle school and high school buildings as of March 31st. The high school and elementary cafeterias purchase new parts. This is one of them. So, <laughs> very, very proud of that. Um, um, let's see. Um, we're also getting a new elementary, um, oh, we already have a new convection oven, and we're getting a new milk cooler for the elementary building. Really great deal on it. It's on back order. So, <laughs> wait. They also <laughs> yep. Oh, I already did. They oh. helped me out. Okay, this is my elementary, my favorites. Well, it was like, they're just really great. They're so sweet. They were willing to take pictures with me. Um, so this is the new oven. Very, very proud of it. Um, and then we have to have, the schools must adopt and enforce nutrition standards policy that considers the requirements of Ohio Revised Code, that big number, and governs the types of food and beverages that may be sold on the premises of its schools. Each school district in accordance with Ohio Revised Code 33313.84 designates staff to prepare an annual report such as this on the district's or school's compliance with the nutrition standards as required by the Ohio Revised Code 33313.84 a copy of the school district's annual report must be uploaded in the consolidated school report survey and Matt Young does take care of that. Um, so, um, just to review the policy of 8500, um, we do use Masonic and we, they guarantee the compliance with the nutrition standards. They are licensed dietitians and they do help prepare our menus and they do post our menus online with the sta standards and allergen information and nutrition labels. We also use Healthy Meal Planner Pro to help further align with nutritional guidelines. Uh, we will get alerts exceeding maximum or not being minimum requirements for standards. Um, smart snacks in schools, vending machines, not sure they're going back this school year, but a la carte will be, and we always um, follow the smart snacks requirements. So we'll provide some juices, um, chips, granola bars, and things like that for our kids. Um, you can access the smart snacks calculator online um, to check out anything that you like to at home and want to check out your bag of chips and see if you're compliant or not and you know, find out why you are or are not compliant. Can I ask real quick with your vending machines? Is it 
because of COVID? Is it because of just like the it was COVID? Students? Yeah, it was COVID. Yeah, so there's no discussion about coming back, but we had some high school students inquire about it. Well, I mean, so like more than half more student body stays after and is an empty activity. So yeah, I'm pro. We have you know feeding them because they're kids and they need nutrition. Right. Right. Um, and I keep a record of all of our compliance, um, CERP and non-compliant, not CERP snacks. And, um, all of our employees are CERP safe certified by attending a workshop once every four years. The certificates are posted and the Board of Health does record the records um, of our compliance. We all have numbers in the corner, so they'll come in and we'll jot the numbers down with our needs. Um, employees know how to temperature check foods for safety, properly wash and prep foods, fruits and vegetables. Um, preparation occurs no longer than two days prior to maintaining fresh foods. Deliveries are every week, mainly Mondays. Um, yeah, every Monday we'll get our big deliveries. We use production sheets and those are kept as records to track how much food we should be prepared um, to help limit our waste. And then of course we have our principles of the hazard analysis and critical points, our HACCP system. It's implemented with the intent of preventing foodborne illness and found in every recipe that we have. Um, we do have allergen information and nutritional labels. There's an appetite the cafeteria right outside the main doors. Um, choking concerns, all with choking concerns. And our, we are all, we all take public school works and CPR in the beginning of the school year. Um, foods, if they're out too long, we do dispose of right away. We do mark it on the production sheet that the food item was disposed of. And of course, we check our expiration dates very frequently. And then looking ahead. Oh, looking ahead, I'm very nervous. I'm not going to lie. Waivers are going to expire as, as of right now. They're going to expire on June 30th, 2022. There's a, they're trying to still push for free the upcoming school year. So we'll hear more as it go, goes on. So we're all in limbo. So as of now, we will count and claim students their meals based on the student's eligibility of free, reduced, or paid as determined by a qualified meal application, direct certification, or other categorical eligibility. We need to provide the information to the community so people are aware that they will have to fill out a lunch application or they will have to pay full price for a lunch. This information should be sent out to families and available on our school's website, along with reminders through multiple channels, such as verbal calls, emails, text messages, and parent newsletters. Um, and looking at also, given the skyrocketing cost of food and supplies, we need to consider how much it will cost to operate next year. Currently, our lunch, is, lunch prices here in the middle price will be out to two seventy-five in elementary, so we have to think about next year. And when the pay lunch equity tool is released, I will get on it right away and use it to calculate the new recommended cost of lunches. Last time we had, a, remember, we had we were forced to raise our lunch prices because we were not been eligible for the commodity uh, exchange had we not raised those. And I, I think when when that comes through, Pam's going to work with myself and, and Tracy next week. Because we're going to start putting in time talks that, because the, all the information I have is the federal government is not going to renew that. So we're going to start putting in time talks next week for parents to be prepared that lunch, the, the free lunches will no longer exist. And we're going to try and have a link to the application for the, the free and reduced lunches for next year. But we're going to start putting in time talks right now this year. So when people can set up lunch accounts, can get all that in place this year when we send stuff out there in the summer, and then that will hopefully limit it to only about 450 people that come back next year and say, we thought we'd lunch for free. Um, but, um, or, uh, or some of us that have to put our kid on a diet. Or, 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 cold, like, or just cold sugar. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but no, it, you know, it, and it's, it, it's tough. And, it, and it's no different here than it is in any other school district. And then, you know, these are conversations that every, every uh, Every food service supervisor and every superintendent's having right now, and, and everybody's in the same boat. But, but uh, we're, we're going to start getting the word out uh, beginning next Friday. We're going to get something in time talks, and it, it will be in every time talk between now and the start of school because there's no indication uh, whatsoever. Because 
last year by before the start of May, it had already been determined that we would have free lunches for this year. And there's been no movement. I, apparently a little bit of discussion yeah, this I last week on the federal know. level had been brought up, but nobody, nobody willing to put it in the form of a motion to say, hey, let's do this. So um, uh, we, we better to prep and then if it happens, that's wonderful. But if we don't prep and then it doesn't happen, then um, uh, be ready for it. So. That's right. We're always prepared. Yeah. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Pam, I want to, I want to take just a minute to thank you for you and your team for everything that you do for our district and our kids. And I also want to thank you for the extra work that you did in working with the team to get the recent grant money uh, that stemmed oh, from from commodities. funds. Thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate thank you. Thank it. you. The, the commodities grant was big. Pam yeah. found that. Yeah, yeah, I saw some of the work just you like, did. You had to sort various by food item, what qualifies, what doesn't. Yeah. A lot of work. No, Thanks. it's great. No, thank you very much. We thank you. It. I love what I do, and that, yeah, that really. makes it all easier. Yeah. So. Yes, it is. All yeah. right. Thanks. I'm sorry. Thanks, Pam. All right. Thank Good you. To see you all. Thanks for your helpers, too. <laughs> Brandon, I got a razor downstairs, that old wrestling razor, if you want to borrow it. <laughs> right, <Sounds> great. Right. <laughs> now I have to apologize to Matt because I just took an hour of his <laughs> five year forecast time up. So. Let's over our forecast time. <laughs> <laughs> We got pizza up there too. So. <laughs> Great. Did you play that because we're going to be here very long? It's really good. It's relevant. Um, so for the five year forecast, our May 2022 five year forecast. So Dave. Dave one second. Yeah. show where it's at on the printed copy uh, from here because it's extremely small to look at as we go. So the May 2022 five-year forecast is the update from the November 2021 five-year forecast. The biggie is the November two, November forecast whenever we do it because it's always setting up the fiscal year. So this is just adjusting um, that forecast. Um, so there's small tweaks as we go along the way and take a look at it. Everybody has in front of them uh, the color May 2022 five-year forecast and the black and white November 2021 five-year forecast. And I have on the screen the May forecast and I want everybody to take a look between the two forecasts down here in the bottom right-hand corner. What does everybody see? We see a more favorable on your print on your handout. Yeah. So on your handout, as we compare them, we're looking at a more favorable colored five-year forecast as opposed to the black and white. So we see our deficit in that final year, fiscal year 2026, is no longer negative $3.2 million from the black and white five-year forecast, but now it's negative 1.8. So even though it's still negative, it's, a favor, you know, it's more favorable from where it was. That's primarily due to more revenue coming in. So again, the forecast is generally conservative with all the estimates, lower on the um, revenue side, and you know, the expenses may be a little higher when we come in. Um, on that, but I'll talk about why that changed for the revenue as we go through the five-year forecast. But um, so the one we're looking at now, 
is more favorable than where it was in November, but still we're going to need a levy as we go forward, and we'll talk about a time frame as we go um, into that. But um, you know, things are more favorable. Where, were the, where are the increases in the revenue that you've noted? Yep, we'll talk about that. Oh, yeah, up? as we go. Okay. Yeah, that's. Yep. So as we look at the notes, everything is going to be in the notes to the five-year forecast um, that everybody has in front of them. And Mike, I have a copy right there too. If you want. Cool. So, and I'll just kind of go through the pages here on the screen, but everybody has in front. So we have our first page that just kind of talks about the introduction. We have our table of contents. In the second page, on the third page, we have just the nature of the forecast. Fourth page is the budgetary process. And pages five, six, seven, and eight just talk about different line items of the five-year forecast. Page number nine is the embedded May 2022 five-year forecast. If anybody loses it, it's always here in the forecast, so mm -hmm. I always like that. And we start here at line 1.010, general property taxes in the forecast. Um, as I go down, in blue highlighted, talks about class one, which is residential agriculture, and class two, which is commercial, industrial, and all other real property that we have. Um, for the assessed valuations, I have highlighted here reappraisal and triennial. The reappraisal requires property to be physically viewed, and that occurred in 2018 and 2012. And the triennial update does not require a physical viewing of the property. And it occurred in 2021 and 2015. And if we look at these charts here, one thing I added was the revenue per one mil all the way on the right-hand side over here. So we can see where it's been for the past number of years for what we have. Um, in yellow, I have NA for the collection percentage. Cuyahoga County doesn't release that. Um, at this point in time, it's going to take them a little time on that for tax year 2021, um, but it should be in the mid to upper 90s as it comes through. Uh, down here, I just wanted to kind of point out our valuation. So this bottom chart that we have down here. So if we're taking class one and class two, which is class one residential agriculture and class two commercial industrial and all others, we can see our valuation has increased um, over the past couple of years. It actually went down back in 19, but look at 2018 and look at 2021. Those have the highest percentage increases. And what takes place in both those time periods would be either the triennial update or the reappraisal. So that's where we really see the growth come through. It's the triennial or reappraisal. We see small uh, adjustments in the years in between but since we just are coming off of the triennial update in 2021, we shouldn't see large swings. But again, we're in the COVID era. We don't know what's going to happen with property valuations as we go. Um, in the middle chart here, in the middle of the page, our total assessed valuations is $430 million. So it's gone up from 395 to 430 And again, we can see the amount for Class 1 and Class 2. It's almost $350 million for our valuation, so that's a positive. Now this, and I'll talk about as we go further on, but that increase in valuation is why we saw some increase in revenue, and I'll touch base on that as we go. So that's page 10, page 11. Uh, we talk about the different types of levies, if anybody's curious on some of those. At the bottom, I have the tax year and collection year information. So tax year is a calendar year, but our fiscal year starts 7-1 and ends 6-30, so that's why we see the difference coming in for revenue. Half is in one year, half's in the other year by fiscal years. Um, if we go to page 12, we have millage. Um, I updated the examples here. So we have an example of revenue per one mil again. We have tax year 20 and 21. And then we have the example of the annual cost to a homeowner for an eight mil levy. And I have the math broken out over here and exactly how it would work for a household market value of $100,000, and that would be a cost for an 8 mil levy of $280 annually to a homeowner. And if that household market value is $200,000 for an 8 mil levy, that would be $560 annually cost to a homeowner. Uh, we talk about market value versus assessed value here, HB 920, which effectively freezes uh, voted real property millage at the dollar amount collected in the first year that millage went into effect. 
and that took place in 1976. I wasn't born yet um, during that time. Inside versus outside millage, we talk about that. Um, and I'm going to touch base more on the math behind inside and outside millage as we start looking at the um, numbers as we go through. Effective millage rate, that's going to be large as we go through. So the effective millage rate is the millage rate um, that is actually levied on the property. So it's always changing the effective millage rate as we go through. Because again, it complies with HB 920. Everything's kind of frozen when that levy's passed at that point in time. Think of it that way. Um, so page 13, we talk about the 20 mil floor. Interesting, in tax year 2008, uh, so more than 10 years ago, of uh, the 613 schools at that time, there were 400 districts, about 65%, at the 20 mil floor. So just to kind of give some perspective that there are a number of schools at that 20 mil floor that take place. We're getting there, will we ever get there? It's automatically gonna happen if it ever does. <clears throat> it just generates more revenue for us. Um, I'm not sure, we'll see. We'll take a look at it as we go. Uh, we talk about real estate taxes, the billing, accounting for general, general property taxes, tax reduction factors, and then we get to the numbers here. So we can see all of our levies. So we have inside of the 10 mills, we get a certain percentage, 4.1. These are unvoted, just given to us by the Ohio Constitution. Then we have all of our levies, so anything prior to 1976, and then 81, 88, 91, 97, 2003, and the most recent levy that passed, 2012. We can see the tax rate in which these went on, 4.9, 4.9, 7.9, and so forth. These are the effective rates that change every year. So we can see what they are for tax year 2020 and for tax year 2021. And this is the 20 mil floor if we're ever gonna get there. We can see the closest one would be our class one. But again, to get to 20, we're gonna have to see how that valuation uh, goes through and we'll see as we go. This down here, um, towards the middle and bottom of page 14, deals with our um, actual levy collection. And in the magenta is what we booked as revenue, which came into us through the year. So we can see for uh, January 1st, 2022, through 630, 2022, we collected $4,761,076 for Class 1 and Class 2 property taxes. When we take that, combined with what we collected between 7-1, 2021, and December 31st, 2021, which was 4,388,044. And I have that math broken out down here in that little blue box. We get $9,149,560. So that's the actual number of um, taxes, revenue, that we collected for Class 1 and Class 2 within fiscal year 2022. And that's going to go to our roll-up, which makes its way into the five-year forecast, and we'll take a look at that. Um, I have the estimated tax revenue collected at 100% collection, and that's from our uh, January tax budget, the alternative tax budget that we approve every year. I have those numbers broken out. Uh, so that's where we come up with this estimated tax collection. Um, as we go further along to the next page, page 15, we can see at the very top, I have this little box here, revenue per one mil. And then the math to get there, we take our total valuation, 430 million, divide by 1,000, we get 430,000. Or we can take 1,765,905, which is this estimated tax revenue at 100%, divide by the rate, 4.1, gives us the same number. We can actually get back to that 430,000. Um, quite a, there are a number of ways to get there. But I just wanted to show the math on um, how we can get to that revenue per one mil. So if we look at uh, tax year 2021, the top portion of um, this page, page 15, we can see our tax rate for when these levies came into play, and we have a green box around 35.7. That's our you know, tax rate for what we have here. Our effective rate is effectively what's taking place on these levies with that HB 920 in effect. So that's how the math breaks out for our estimated tax revenue. Uh, so we take our effective rates for tax year 2021, and again, we're not at the 20 mil floor, but it's possible we can get there. Um, and then we can see the breakout of revenue per classes. So class one for our levies, class two for our levies, any public utility personal property in the pink, and then A, B, and C added together gives us our estimated tax revenue at 100% collection. And then we can see you know, what that would look like at 97 up here on the uh, top portion of that page. In the middle, uh, I further break it out by assessed valuations. So we have our 430 million that we have in total, and we have our 100% right here. 
and we can see what it would look like at 97 and again we have to take out our homestead and credits in green and our public utility personal property in pink and we're looking at just the blue at the very top and we can see 97, 96, and 92 and I have highlighted here 9,058,610 in yellow. That's a number that's also used in the five-year forecast for years going forward. So I just wanted to show everybody how those numbers came to be. Um, we can see down here the updated chart at the bottom of page 15 for the tax rates in Cuyahoga County. Us and independents are the lowest, uh, 34 and 35. And we can see the next closest one, Tom, Brooklyn, 63. So we know that our tax rate has remained stagnant for 10 some years. Um, but what has happened with our costs? Our costs have risen. What has happened with other portions of revenue? The phase of TPP has gone down. So those are really the main factors um, which we're looking at. We have some revenue going down the phase of TPP. We know our expenses are rising, but our tax rates kind of remain the same. So, you know, just in relation to other school districts in Cuyahoga County, um, we're at the lowest um, for where we're at. I know Independence is discussing putting on a levy uh, for their school district. Um, it's, you know, even passing a levy, let's say for 10 mills, and that would bring us up to 45, we're still at the lowest point in Cuyahoga County, us and Independence. So we're very low in relation to other school districts that are taking place. So that's a, that's a big benefit that we have here. So, um, you know, we'd almost have to double to get to where Brooklyn's at uh, of all of our levies. Um, and if we look at Shaker Heights, I mean, that they're at 189. I mean, we'd never get there realistically. Uh, we'd have to put massive ta tax levies on every year just to get in the ballpark of where they would be. And I think they're talking about putting on a new tax levy in Shaker Heights, too. So, yeah, that's uh, – when you really see it, it's kind of crazy. And, again, these are all levies put together, so permanent improvement, bond issues, you know, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, and, again, tax levies. no debt. And I, uh, we don't. I think I'm safe in saying that we're the only – district on that list that has no debt right now no bond issues we're not paying on any loans to the state we're not we have no debt as a school district uh, the next page page 16 is tax year 20 so just a comparison I always like to compare uh, figures for what we're looking at and we come down here to page 17 and we can see our roll-up so again those numbers highlighted in yellow make up the figures that we're seeing in row one for the five-year forecast and we can see that 9.1 million in fiscal 22 is what we actually collected this year we can see that 9 million 58,000 for fiscal 23 24 25 and 26 so I'm estimating conservatively that that 96 percent collection rate jives up to what we're looking here for all these different tax years 20 19 18 17 16 and 15 we're in that mid to upper 90s so I think it's safe to say that 96 percent will hit that mark going forward um, for delinquent property taxes, row two, we've collected 171,019, 296,020, 248,021, and now we're looking at 229,022. Um, conservatively estimated that to be 150,000 flatline. You never know what we're going to collect, but I think that's you know a safe figure to put in there. We don't want to overextend ourselves, and we come in short. I'd rather come in short a little bit, and we'll have a favorable you know mm -hmm. forecast, which is what we're looking at now. Um, these are the different settlements, and these might quiet down with uh, the passing of uh, the new law that takes place with school districts and settlements um, with valuations uh, that go out there. But we can see where we've been at historically, and you know, going forward, that might not be the case as we look. And we can see the impact of the laws that Columbus passes on school districts, and that's tangible. We can see that. So we can see all the settlements that have taken place. And a lot of that deals with valuations where the county is valuating. We don't go at, you know, look at residential. We're looking at commercial. And a commercial property may be undervalued severely, and Cuyahoga County will come back um, and keep that. And we'd have to you know, um, attest that and challenge it and say, well, that's not really the fair market value of what those properties are, just to, so we get you know, the fair amount of taxes coming back from the district. The biggest concerns for us are the, the Rockside Road corridor up at the top of the hill because those, are, those units are, depending on when they get assessed, if they're empty, they get assessed at a lower rate. And then I've met with two of those owners on multiple occasions. Um, when they've been renovated and they're occupied, they assess at a higher rate. So that's 
that's when that jockey's back and forth, and that's when David Seed has gone after him and not gone after him. So I've had multiple meetings with two of those order, owners before, and I think with this new, with the new law in the books, that they'll wait till they're vacant to try and get reassessments done, and then, um, you know, on some of those properties. <clears throat> because those are those some of those buildings up there, both on the left and the right, are multiple unit buildings with multiple thousands of square foot. So they, you know, at any given time, uh, those owners have vacant vacancies up there. So uh, I have highlighted here the only way a school district gets any additional money on voted millage is from new construction, from having their millage reduced to the minimum amount allowed by law, the 20 mil floor, or valuation increasing inside millage collection. Um, so let's take a look at that one, valuation. So we'll go back and let's take a look at page 16. So I kind of have it up here. I'm going to highlight this figure right down here. Take a look at that. So that's our estimated tax revenue for tax year 2020, and that's our inside millage. It's $1.6 million, $1,621,551. And again, remember, our assessed valuation is $395 million for that tax year 2020. Let's check out 2021. Same figure. 1.7, so about 100,000 higher, give or take. And that's because the valuation increased and we see that increase for the inside millage. So we take that full tax rate and we can see the benefit of the valuation going up to 430 million. We now see a small increase <coughs> in the inside millage, about 100,000, a little bit more than, than that would be. So that's where we see a tangible you know, increase in revenue from valuation increasing from one tax year to the other tax year. I just thought that was interesting to really point out um, for inside millage. Um, let's go to public utility personal property, uh, line 1.020. And again, the roll up uh, for anybody listening online to YouTube or anyone here in attendance, uh, they match the five year forecast. So we can see fiscal 19, fiscal 20, 21, and then 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. All those numbers that are totaled up make up that line in the five year forecast. Um, as we go to the next page, page 18, uh, tangible personal property tax is our public util utility personal property, PUP for short. And these would be our utilities. And we have methods of valuation for rail railroads, electric companies, and all others, natural gas, heating, pipeline, waterworks. Um, we have uh, the assessed valuation, again, the same chart, but now we're highlighting public utility personal property here. And we can see we've gone from 46 million to 58 million. 67 million, 73 million, 76 million, 77 million, and 81 million. So that's where we're at now, at 81 million. So it's increased, and there hasn't, you know, it's kind of slowed down. It was really fast back in 2016 and 17, mm -hmm. uh, but that curve's starting to slow down for where we're at as far as the increases go. Um, could it decrease? It's possible, too. Um, it could. This was the number we got all excited about last year, and then they readjusted it on us. Yeah. We called them and asked what, if that was correct. Well, they came out with like 125 yeah. million, and I was doing, you know, I ran Bedford. downstairs right away. I'm like, we just hit, you know. Yeah, we, we thought we hit the lottery. Bedford's number was way up, too. Yeah. We called them. They, they yeah. haven't even seen it yet. No. <laughs> and then they came out, and Cuyahoga County just said, yeah, for whatever reason, they put the wrong numbers on that <laughs> sheet. And, you know, but that, that was a weird time period. Um, uh, the one thing to point out here on the next page, page 20, is the top. So there is no effective rate for public utility personal property. It's at the full tax rate. So as the valuation increases for us, and we've seen that, we get that benefit, uh, the full tax rate. There's no effective rate, which kind of, you know, makes sure the money's always the same every year. It just goes up. Um, we can see, again, the actual collections in Magenta, uh, 1486605 for the second half of the year, um, of the fiscal year, which would be the first half of settlement. And we can see down below uh, 1,360,152. And when you add both those together, we get, again, the box in the right-hand corner, 2,846,757. And that's the actual amount for fiscal 22 that we booked as far as property taxes go for public utility personal property. Um, we have the same charts here for uh, tax year 2021. Um, and we're looking at about 2.9 as we go. So, you know, it, it's larger. Um, we can see where we stand at in Cuyahoga County at the bottom of page 21, third behind Bedford and Cleveland, which is great for Cuyahoga Heights. Um, the next page, page 22, is the prior year, tax year 2022 for comparison. 
And then we go to our roll up. We can see that 2,846,000 as the amount for fiscal 22. And down here, this is where I came up with the amounts for fiscal 23, 24, 25, and 26. My thought is that we're hopeful it's going to increase, and I have the approximate revenue besides each one of these valuations for each tax year. And I'm just saying that, you know, if the you know bottom falls out on us, you know, I think it's safe to say, you know, that valuation from tax year 2018, the 73 million, you know, will still be higher than that. So if we put that in the forecast, we know we're going to come in higher than that 2.6. I get leery, you know, increasing it every year because we would bake costs in, and I never want to, you know, be on the wrong side of that. So I think it's safe to say that, uh, you know, that 73 million, we wouldn't, you know, the forecast has contingencies built in if uh, it were to go down. But again, we're hopeful it's not, but conservatively speaking, you know, just want to play it safe. And as we continue to go, we're looking at state aid. This was fun uh, when they changed everything up mid-year on us uh, with the state. So uh, this talks about the history. We have COVID as the carve out here, and we have a new funding formula, which was the fair school funding plan uh, was passed in the fiscal 22-23 Ohio budget bill, which is HB 110, and signed by Governor DeWine July 1st, 2021. Um, the next page, uh, 25, just further talks on that fair school funding plan. 26, we really start to look at the definitions of each of these line items. And one thing we can see is there's more restricted funding coming from this new funding formula, which means uh, for gifted, we have to earmark those funds for gifted aspects. We can't use it for unrestricted purposes, which means you know we don't have to just keep it for gifted. We can use it for uh, multiple reasons. Some of these lines don't have the definition because ODE has not released the definition of these items on their website. And I didn't want to pull from other forecasts or from other places. I'd rather just have the uh, full definition from ODE, but they're still working on that from when they implemented the uh, funding formula in January. Um, so these are the definitions that we have. We can see on the next page, page 27, I have some comparisons, fiscal 20, 21, and two aspects of 22 back in October and now in April with the new funding formula. So again, we can see the restricted line items uh, for what they would be, and we can see our total funding uh, for where we're at. Again, it's not, you know, compared to our property taxes, the state aid is very minimal, and we're viewed as a wealthy district in the eyes of the state. And then we come down to the roll-up on page 28. Uh, we can see um, where we're at, and flatline um, the estimate going forward. We know that this funding formula is in place for fiscal 22 and 23, but going forward, it's kind of a toss up. I mean, we don't know um, where we're gonna be at with uh, Columbus as we go. Um, our casino tax revenue has increased uh, from prior years. So that's been a, a great uh, surprise to us. But again, how long is that gonna stay maybe it does maybe it doesn't but i'm a little more conservative on that estimate going forward it's going to go up sports could gambling starts it could, next it, year right it could be it could be huh yeah yeah um as we keep going the uh, next page page 29 talks about restricted funding uh so again those areas that we had highlighted um here uh would be our restricted funding and before we go too far, if we look at the USAS, Uniform School Accounting System definitions, I have the new ones here highlighted, but keep in mind that the Auditor of State, to my knowledge, has not updated the USAS manual to account for these new function codes that we're supposed to book this revenue with. So ODE came out and said, book career tech education at 3215, book gifted revenue to 3216, English learners 3217. Uh, base cost, student wellness, 3218, but those aren't in the USAS manual, so uh, the Auditor of State has to update that. Um, so it's just the joys of, you know, having that new funding formula, you know, started mid-year, that not everybody's on the same page, and these are kind of the impacts that we see from it. Um, we have the definitions down here for those items of rest uh, restricted funding and catastrophic aid. Uh, this is a breakdown of just catastrophic aid going through um, 
for an estimate, I'll keep going. And we can see at the bottom of page 31, um, that amount for uh, the total restricted aid. So we can see in 2020, it was a little over 8,000, about 8,500. 21, 8,500. 22 in October, 8,500. Now, um, with the new funding formula, we're looking at 70,000 for restricted uh, funding. So we have now 41,000 that we have to restrict to gifted um, as we go uh, you know, into it. So we have to spend that 41,000, the state's saying, restricted for gifted aspects. No longer is it unrestricted, and we can kind of use it for different areas. Is that a problem? Everybody thinks best. For us, it's not a problem, but bigger schools, I mean, they could have more funding generated. It, it could be a problem for the bigger ones, the larger schools that are out there. I'm worried about that. Um, no money, more problems. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, we can see the, uh, the roll up that we have here. So, with all of our restricted funding and also adding in the catastrophic cost reimbursement, we're looking at about $140,000 for fiscal 22. And I'll keep going. Property tax allocation. I didn't change anything in this section um, from the November forecast. But again, I want to point out on page <coughs> 34 a very important item in the middle, which is if we look at the TV screen, we can see our reduction of revenue. This is the phase out of TPP. So this is, you know, a crucial cause in the need for a new levy is, again, we have costs increasing. We have revenue for property taxes going up slightly, but not nearly at the pace that we would need to keep up with those um, increases for costs, but we also have a loss of revenue. So no longer is this revenue just staying you know, in place, but they're taking away 200 some thousand dollars every year from us until it's completely gone. Um, you know, we'll try to politic for it to not leave, but the law in place right now is that it's being taken away. So this is the need for a levy. Um, and if you're looking at you know where we were at in 2018, we had 2.5 million coming in, 2.3 in 19, 2.1 in 20, uh, 1.9. We're at 1.7 now, then 1.5. That's a lot of revenue to just lose out of our budget. So, I mean, the need for a levy, we may need a second levy about five years after we pass this first one, just due to the fact that we're losing you know all this revenue for that TPP phase out. So we have one on the horizon that we're looking at, but we're going to need an additional one you know, soon thereafter because of, you know, that aspect. Um, unless we can get the state to freeze it, which we'll definitely try. Um, we have the roll-up for the property tax allocation items, uh, homestead exemption, the credits, uh, the phase-out of TPP, which, again, we see that going down every year. Um, we come to all other revenues. On the next page, 36, I just want to point out the bottom of that page, page 36, deals with the uh, interest rates coming back to us. And across the state, those have gone down dramatically for COVID um, in the economy. So before, um, you know, I'll kind of show where we were at with the revenue, but we were looking at 2.5, 2.3, 2.2, 2.1 for Star Ohio. And we're not even at one, we're at 0.08. 0.07 and we do have red tree which holds you know a lot of our investments that deal with um you know our portfolio uh, treasury bills cds commercial paper but you know those are even going down too it's just the global economy is just going down at this point in time for where it was so um but to be uh you know optimistic look at march so we do see star ohio coming back up so maybe that's you know uh, a positive that we can see on the horizon for interest rates. Um, the next page, tuition. Um, we can see our students approximately 200, and we've had about 200 for the past, you know, this year and two prior years, 2021 and 22. We had about 130 <coughs> in 19, not even 118, and less than 75 in 17. And we can see the rates have remained the same in 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. We changed it between 17 and 18. Um, you know, is it time to increase those rates? That'll be a discussion going forward um, that we would have. Um, we can see the bottom of page 37 deals with um, the SF tuition, which is Tim O'Keefe working uh, to get the school district 
revenue for our court place students um, with relatives or foster care. We have approximately 20 to 25 students um, of that designation, and we can see the reimbursement that we're receiving from the state is $16,000 per student. Tremendous amount of money for those students coming in. But again, it's hard to judge how many of those kids we're going to have each year going forward. Where do you see this? Uh, at the bottom of 37. Yep. <coughs> Yeah. So over the years, we've had, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 21, 25, 20. So comes and goes, but approximately 20, I'm going to say, over the course of those years. Um, I'll keep going through. Uh, then we have our roll-up on page 39. And I just wanted to point out uh, lines uh, 2 and 3 would be our tuition students. So we've seen a lot of revenue coming in. The difference between line three and line two, the H, is for special education. So that's the difference between line two and three. A couple special education kids um, would be on line three. Um, line four or five, that's the revenue coming in from interest on our investments. And we can see where we were at back in you know, 2019 for Star Ohio, $250,000. Fiscal 20, $220,000. And now, you know, we're at $15,000, and our cash has increased since that point in time. So, again, it's those interest rates, it, you know, but that's everybody collectively all together. Uh, we see, again, the items rolled up, and it makes its way to the forecast. And we'll keep going to all their financing sources. Um, the largest item here on page 40 is just going to be the refunds that we would get back from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, and they gave back those large premium refunds uh, during the pandemic. Um, I don't think that's going to happen uh, going forward from them. Uh, now we, we start looking at expenses. So we're done with our revenue. We're going to take a look at expenses. So uh, our salary and wages, personnel services on page 41, uh, we can see our percentage increases for the unions, 2% on the base, 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 2% on the base. We have those costs increasing. Again, revenue is being taken away from us, and our taxes are basically flatlined. So that, you know, it's unsustainable, you know, on the horizon for us. But we know that um, going forward. Um, Keep going through the pages. On page 43, we have the estimate and actual for all the salaries in the district, object code 111. And all expenses are uh, organized by object code as we go, 100s, 200s, 400s, so forth. Um, so we can see the estimate here for um, all of our uh, certified. <clears throat> line 52 is going to be, uh, and actually line 51 is going to be the MTSS. So Dr. Freed, who is here, a portion of his salary is picked up with those ESSER funds. So uh, line 52 is going to be the grant picking that up over the course of a couple years that we have. Um, if we go to page 44, we can see classified, non-certified salaries here. And we have the box around that figure at the bottom of the page. And then if, as we continue to go, we can see the comparison on page 45, uh, the amount difference and the percentage difference. And then we have our roll-up on page 46. And <clears throat> if we look at you know, this very top line right down here, I have a couple boxes above some of the figures. And if we look at our salaries in the 111 object code, we can see um, in fiscal 22, it's that 6036000 And the increase to fiscal 23 is going to be 5%. And the 5% is the base, which is a 2% increase, the step, when teachers go, you know, from step 10 to step 11, that's about a five. That's about a three percent increase for the step. So you take the base of two, the step of three. That's our five percent right there. Then I also have an asterisk uh, for fiscal 23. Could be a potential new teacher added of fifty thousand dollars that we would have. And then going into fiscal 24, we take that total amount, six point three million dollars, and we add five percent, which is the base of two and the step of three. And we get that figure of 6.7 million. Then going from fiscal 24 to fiscal 25, um, we're looking at a 3% increase, which is just the step, because no longer are we operating under the CBA, but the step always exists unless it's uh, negotiated to freeze out. And then we have the asterisks, the two asterisks, which would be the three teachers that we hired with those ESSER grant funds. Um, and then we've been picking up with the ESSER grant for fiscal 22 and fiscal 23. 
in fiscal 24, uh, you know, the general fund then would cover those funds uh, or those positions if it happens in fiscal 25 and fiscal 26. And then we can see that total amount for fiscal 25 add on 3% for the step for fiscal 26, and that's where that $7.3 million comes from. Um, and again, we can see the costs rolled up for our grand total all the way at the bottom, and it makes its way to the five-year forecast for what we have for salaries going forward in the future. Um, on page 47, uh, we talk about the um, methodology, and it touches base on when those contract negotiations have ended. You know, that then comes back to opening, opening the negotiation process between the unions and the Board of Education. Um, on page 48, we're talking about employees' retirement and insurance benefits uh, going forward. Haven't really changed much since the November forecast here, but I am hearing good things about Del Delta Dental and VSP. Tom? They're good. They're outstanding. Yeah. Um, my dentist is, uh, was just saying that he said the best coverage, and he goes, and, it's, and it costs less. He goes, it's, and he's both a dentist and a physician, and uh, I'm, I'm terrible with eyeglasses. Um, I'm Mr. Destructo, and uh, I got my eyeglasses, and I, I broke them at, within a week and took them back in, and, and the, they were covered and repaired very quickly. So uh, I, the, the, Matt did a great job of working with the... Uh, it was a team. Like, we all... Working with them, and, and we, got, we got better coverages out of both of them for less money. So. Okay. so if we look here at the forecast on this page, just want to point that out. Uh, yeah, as a team, we worked on that collect collectively together. Um, but look at dental. So back in 2020, we were at 6402 for single and 143 for family. But we were paying less with Delta Dental, 49 and 136, and we're getting better coverage. So that's a you know win-win for everybody here. Less cost for the district and employees and better coverage, everybody going forward. Um, and again, same thing with vision. You know, everybody's paying less for vision and you know, better service, better provider. Um, we can see the uh, premium rate increases over the years for medical, drug, dental, and vision. 2% was last year for medical and drug. Um, suburban Health, which were a member of that consortium, there's about 20 or so districts in it. Um, you know, there's talk of 10% <coughs> as a percentage increase. Um, and that's, you know, they're just floating that out there. Is it going to be that when rates get adjusted later on this year? I don't know. Um, but I do know that the consortium is starting to see COVID cases come in. Um, there's one that's over $800,000. Um, so, you know, they're seeing it at the consortium level. So, I mean, we could see that going forward. We are conservatively uh, forecasted, and we'll talk about that going forward. But you know, it's just something I wanted to, you know, have everybody be aware of that, you know, that could come. And again, that's a vote of all the consortium members. So they get all the school districts together, Independence, Brexville, us, uh, and they say, you know, the consultant's going to recommend a percentage rate increase to the group, and then the group would then vote yay or nay or a different amount. So the group collectively votes, the majority, you know, would be the result of that going forward. Um, 49 just has more information. 50 uh, just has the comparison between years. Uh, 51 is the roll up, and I just wanted to point to the middle of page 51, and we can look at object code 240 and 250. 240 is going to be insurance, medical, drug, dental, and vision for certified, and 250 object code is medical, drug, dental, and vision for non certified. And that percentage increase in brackets next to those figures, 12%, 12%, 12%, 12 12%. So we're conservatively forecasting um, a high percentage. Will it hit that? We hope not. And there's you know room in there uh, for savings. But in case it does go that high, the forecast is built to handle that. So going forward. Um, we see the roll up. And again, that grand total would go to the items in the five-year forecast. Um, I'll keep going through 400 object codes, purchase services. On page 54, we talk about our approximate 30 positions that we contract through the ESC of Northeast Ohio. And we have various reimbursements for some of those positions, idea grants, uh, our Title I grant. Uh, but we can see that total cost, and that total cost for those 30 positions gets booked to purchase services at this point in time and historically for the district. 
Um, those items are getting booked, if we look at the little square at the very top, on lines 48, 49, and 50. Uh, so as we go through, uh, we're looking at 410 object codes, and we can see the budget for the next five years. So everybody's able to see their baseline budget. Uh, we do you know, various adjustments throughout the year, maybe take from one account and give to another account as we go. Um, but this is the baseline starter for all these objects. And you know, working with the principals, uh, the assistant superintendent, the superintendent, various departments that we have here to adjust our budgets um, you know, every six months when we adjust this five-year forecast as we go. So we're always communicating and adjusting those as we need uh, to take place. Um, so we can see on page 55, you know, the 410 object codes, uh, the f uh, on the bottom of page 56, the 411 object code, and again, 48, 49, and 50 would be all of those 30 uh, workers through the ESC of Northeast Ohio. And we have a 2.5 built-in uh, percentage increase, which is, you know, kind of been um, what we're looking at through the ESC. Um, the 413 object code on the next page, line 57, um, that's our nursing services. Um, if we look at line 61, we can see that's uh, our contract that we signed with Tim O'Keefe. He's the one that works on those court place students that we saw that high revenue figure for. So he works with the district, with our EMIS uh, person, and we're always making sure that we're coding those uh, children and you know, <coughs> finding them so everything's accurate because we have to work with different various schools to make sure it's coded properly in EMIS and both school districts have to sign off on it for us to get those funds. Um, as I go through, we can see our, you know, line 65 and 66, uh, legal and architect services. Um, 75, carpet cleaning. On the next page, we have all of our repair and maintenance items that we have for the district. Um, and again, we, we budget conservatively, but we hope the actual cost would come in lower, but maybe not. Maybe a lot of stuff needs to be repaired, and we have to shift more funds over. Um, if a boiler goes down, you know, that could be a large item that we have. Um, continuing to go through, on the next page, 59, on page 60, we see more of our uh, costs. On line 141, this is our insurance, our property insurance with SORSA. Uh, that has been going up, our costs. So, you know, when the district insures its buses and its school buildings and facilities, um, you know, to ensure that that cost has been going up. And we'll see that contract come on um, in a little bit. Um, yeah, I, one, one thing to add to that, he, he's... They've really been pushing hard for um, uh, technology insurance, and we've kind of passed on that the last two times. And he, the last two times that he's met with us, he's really pushed hard um, for some insurance on that. And one of the things that we've heard in a couple of legal updates are more and more districts starting to add some cyber insurance to that. So I don't know how much longer we're, we're going to maybe stay away from that I, at some point in time. That that's that. that I might even include John in that discussion because it seems like that's more and more, and, he, and he's presented it to us at least the last two years. Um, uh, but it it seems like I don't know, Mike, with the updates you've been at, but a lot of the updates we've been at, it's a big discussion uh, amongst districts, the cybersecurity and insurance over some of the things that that. that right. Previous district kind of we caught it, but yeah. it was 4.3 million dollars. <coughs> Now, we are very careful. We have, you know, have very stringent processes uh, for payroll. Somebody has to walk in their sheet. We don't take any, you know, adjustments via email. I don't want to diverge everything that we have here. We have a two-person authentication for all of our uh, bank software that we have to log into. Uh, we meet on a regular basis with our reps from Huntington Bank, and uh, both of them are named Marine. So I remember, and this is a funny story, I'm like, Tom, you know, we're meeting with Huntington Bank. We're going to have the Marines here. He's like, why is the Army coming? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, no, their name is Marine. So that was, uh, and as we go, uh, line 154, uh, pest control. Uh, that's very important here. We know, you know, uh, just from all of our um, dealings. Uh, the next page, uh, 432 is going to be our professional development, uh, professional meetings. 
Uh, we've been having our grants pick up a lot of these expenditures as well, so that's uh, further helped the general fund um, as we continue to go. Page 62, um, you know, we can see more uh, expenses. Our utilities, we're starting to look at those at the bottom of page 62. Electric, water, sewer, um, we're looking good with those estimates. Gas on the next page. Uh, the 470s object code, um, these would be our outplaced students that we would have. And uh, the maintenance of uh, effort equation comes into play. And I haven't really talked about that with the board, and maybe I'll do that at one of my discussion points going in the future. But that's actually a very uh, important calculation, maintenance of uh, effort. And we have to hit that. And if we don't, uh, we would have to pay that money back to the state. And I've heard other districts failing uh, by a substantial amount. Uh, so it's something that you have to make sure so much money is spent every year in certain function codes. Um, so there's a math calculation of it. And again, I'll, I'll touch base on that in a future board meeting, but just very cognizant about maintenance of effort, which primarily hits this 470 object code that we have going forward. Um, and then we have everything rolled up on the next page. And again, those items make its way into the five-year forecast. And we can see the actual to estimate, so the actual from fiscal 21, was 3,072,399, and the estimate is 3.6. So again, you know, we estimate higher, and you know, we come in, you know, needs and wants. We're always kind of, you know, preaching that, looking at it through that basis to tackle it. Um, continuing to go, supplies and materials. Um, worked a lot with Mr. Young on the textbooks, so we've uh, we adjusted our budget for the textbooks. But again, on uh, you know, we're looking at the elementary school general supplies, middle school general supplies. We're looking at those budgets, high school general supplies. Um, District-wide, uh, then we go to classroom supplies, 511, 512, office supplies, um, 514, health and hygiene. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I want to say I was talking about the high budget that we had in place for health and hygiene cleaning for the elementary, middle, and high school because we didn't know if COVID lived on surfaces at that point in time. So I wasn't, we weren't sure how much to put in those budgets at that point in time. We've since learned that COVID you know, doesn't live on surfaces nearly as long as we thought it did, or if at all. Um, so we scaled that, you know, forecast down in those budgets going forward. Um, that's the 514. 516 would be uh, software materials. So, um, you know, we know our software um, is very useful. We're using it right now, board docs, um, as we go. 517 computer supplies. We are seeing an uptick in computer supplies. So 131, that is an item, you know, as we're getting more Chromebooks for the students, you know, we are seeing a need for more supplies for tech and computer services as we go. Um, 519, uh, other supplies. 137 is our graduation supplies, that row uh, that we have coming up. And that's going to be in another, what, couple of weeks? Graduation we're going to have. Um, we have our parking passes on 139 going forward. Um, 520 starts our College Credit Plus textbooks that we purchase. Uh, textbooks for the elementary school in 520, middle school and high school. Uh, the next page we have our supplemental textbooks, the 524 object code. As I keep going, the 530 library books, 540s, periodicals. Um, 570s would be our operations, maintenance, and repairs. So we have our budgets uh, in place for that. Uh, row 201 is our district snow melt and uh, rock salt. So if we have a worse off winter, we're going to have to buy more snow, melt, and rock salt just to make sure it melts all that snow. Uh, trash liners for 202. Um, you know, our plumbing supplies, 205, that we would have in place. Paint, ceiling tiles. Um, as we go, 580s deal with operations and repair of our motor vehicles. Now the 580s go to our T reports. So as I work on the T reports, which are our transportation reports given to ODE, they're always looking at what we spent on our transportation. So uh, buses, other vehicles, our vans, and they want to know specifically the object code. So that's why we have to separate um, our transportation vehicles for those T reports in here. Um, and then we have the roll up on the next page, page 75. And again, that makes its way into the five-year forecast. We have our capital outlay. Uh, nothing's really changed for capital outlay. That budget stays at a flat line, 150,000. We've been tackling all of our equipment needs. Uh, you know, uh, Ms. Mead was talking about the cart that we bought, and again, we, you know, the uh, convection oven that we're going to have at the elementary school as we go forward. Um, 
other objects on page 80, nothing's really changed here with the other objects. The largest cost uh, has always been our audit costs as well as the auditor and treasurer fees from Cuyahoga County. So for them to process our property taxes, they take a portion out of it. And that's what we um, have to book on line 11. Um, and I do want to point out our transfers on the next page. This is new, page 83. So set-asides. We haven't really dealt with set-asides because we've had an offset. So what set-asides are, and I've dealt with this every year with our auditors, um, school districts are required by state statute uh, to annually set aside an amount based on a statutory formula for capital improvements and maintenance, amounts not spent by fiscal year end or offset by other restricted resources received during the year must be held in cash at fiscal year end and carried forward to be used for the same purpose in future years. Now we can see the set aside requirement. Again, these make its way into our audit reports. So if we were to look in our audit reports and look at the set aside um, section in the notes, we would see these figures and I just pulled it from there. But the offsets deal with our money in the three fund for Charter Steel. So we would receive revenue from Charter Steel, which effectively offset that set-aside requirement. Now, the agreements that we have, which were about, I believe, 15 years for Charter Steel, we're at, this is the last year for the major aspects of that. Now, we do have smaller agreements that we've uh, signed with Charter Steel, um, but we may need a transfer to fulfill that set-aside requirement. And I've put that on line three, um, and that we can see there about $50,000. Um, so that might be a new transfer that we would see going forward. Now, Mr. Evans was talking about you know, new agreements that potentially we could have with um, Charter Steel going forward. I know at some previous board meetings that we uh, touched base on, and that could come to be, could not. Um, but again, if it does, that would take away this $50,000, and we would use those Charter Steel funds going forward for that set-aside requirement. But by law, we do have to set aside a certain portion of our funds if they're not offset for those capital improvements and maintenance going forward. Um, we have our advances out, nothing's changed on that, and then we have our encumbrances on the last page and nothing's changed there. So, um, you know, that's the updated forecast in May. Two weeks to, you know, review it. If there are any questions, you know, we'll definitely address those and we'll look to board approve it the 25th. Any questions from anybody up here? Or? I have some, but I'll Okay. There's just some line items that I was like, cool. But it's not okay. And that's my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Archio. Um, agenda item four, comments from the public. I don't believe we have anyone here this evening to public comments. So let's go on to Treasurer's Business uh, number five. Thank you, Mr. Dobbins. Uh, just one motion tonight. Motion to approve the minutes of the April 27, 2022 regular meeting as found in attachment T1. Uh, Mrs. Shuker. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Ms. Prouse. Aye. Mrs. Zetter. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Treasurer's discussion comments. Uh, just one item. Um, we have the uh, Ohio Fair School Funding Summit. Uh, they sent letters to Mr. Evans, myself, and Mr. Dobbins. And I just wanted to share that with anybody. Uh, if anybody's interested, I did call them up. There's no cost to go. Uh, it's at 9 a.m. at Old Tangy High School, June 7th. So we have time at the next meeting to you know, prove anybody that would want to go or however we want to do it. But it's at 9 in the morning at Olin Tangy. They said it's, you know, uh, the whole day. Um, all the major players are going to be there. Mike DeWine, um, Bob Cup, um, Mr. Patterson, Mr. Huffman. You know, even though we get such a small amount of state aid, you know, relatively speaking, uh, we get just a bit more than like Putin Bay and Kelly's Island schools. And then we're <laughs> third on the list. So it, it, it's not material for us, but... You know, it is important to hear those uh, items and, you know, show support with other school districts. But again, for, you know, materially speaking, our state aid is just a little more than the islands that we have to us. So, um, I've already registered. I'm, I'm going down. We're good. We're good. Um, I, I guess we can hold off till next meeting, but I, I would be, at least at this point, I'd say I'd be interested in attending this board meeting. And I would say the importance of this is that they've been stressed by the, from at least from the superintendent's point of view, is that the, the fair school funding plan was only guaranteed through the biennial budget to, for the two years. So the importance of it is it's a five or six year phase. And so if 
it doesn't com get completely phased in unless there's a long range plan for it and that it doesn't get into the next biennial budget. So the, the, the feelings by the superintendents were that this needs to be discussed now so that new leadership doesn't say, well, next time around, it's not part of the budget. We're just going to go back to the old plan. There, I think there's a real high fear that that will happen. And all the years of all the work that went into this will just get put by the wayside and, and it'll, it'll get kicked out. And I think that there's a relatively fair number of people in Columbus that would like to see that happen. So um, there's a sense of urgency about making sure we keep the ball rolling right now. Um, Representative Cup and Patterson both term limit out. They won't be around to lead the charge on this anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the superintendents and a lot of people that put the work into this, a lot of the treasurers want to make sure that the governor knows that we're serious about wanting this to stay in place for many, many years to come. So uh, that was the reasoning behind this. So. Okay, I appreciate that background. I was I was uncertain what the motivation. Yeah, that's this. That's just uh, to say not to let this. They don't want. They don't want this to get to the next election. And say, oh, by the way, we need to keep this in place. And they say, ah, too late. We're going to develop the next budget, and this isn't going to be a part of it. So. I appreciate that background. Yeah, I, I think you just started coming. Uh, we can postpone next next meeting a motion for a vote on this. Superintendent, this is number seven. Righty, uh, motion to approve a geotechnical proposal GPD uh, uh, technical services per the attached estimate to perform a hillside study, Cog High Schools, at the cost of twenty-one thousand two hundred dollars. And I ask that that be approved. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve uh, agenda item seven A, the contract with geotechnical. Second. Okay. Mr. Seconds. Just just a little bit off that, Mr. Dobbs. I walked out there. I, the, the crack that we fixed in the band room, um, there's a crack that lines up within the locker room directly below it and the hallway up above. And if you walk out into the stadium, you look that there's some bowing in the stadium. Now, you would never know that sitting in the stadium. But we want to make sure that the hillside has been sliding. It doesn't make a lot of sense to fix a lot of things inside the building if the hillside's sliding and it continue to cause the things. Mr. Dobbins and I also noticed that there's a lot of water running through uh, a drain on a day that it wasn't raining. It hadn't rained probably within 48 hours. And one of the conversations we had is, you, you notice that Mayor Bocci is fixing the hill here for about the 12th time in the last five years. <laughs> um, uh, and, and they know that there's uh, some pipe breakage underneath here, and, and that's washed away some of their work. So there's some concerns involved, um, just to make sure that we're not going to do some work, and, and all for not if there's some movement underneath. So uh, GPD originally thought that I wanted them to go this way. I said, no, 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 I need you to come north on this. So. So Jason came out and I showed him, I, I want to make sure the hillside north of the, and where the stairs are. And, and, and again, if you step out on the football field, you can see some bowing there. Uh, those, the concrete, uh, the stadium was put in concrete forms and, and there's a little bit of wash up, but I think there's technology that can, that can, you can fill in, in with that, uh, if that's what needs to be done. But I just want to make sure that we're stable underneath there before we start to do anything in for the long range. So, um, Jason knows what I'm looking to get out of that. They had done some surface area looks and said everything's fine. And I'm not good enough, Jason. I want. Uh, I'm looking for a little bit more than that if we're going to start renovating some things. So. And you reviewed it, Mr. Dobbins. Yes, Mr. Dobbins gave a nice tour of the site yesterday, and we had a chance to look at a number of different perspectives of the uh, the hillside. And, and I fully agree that, that this is um, the right time to do this preliminary work if we're going to do all this work on the building. Sort of how much more. And then it says here that they will reduce some of the charges if we provide the school personnel provides pictures of the cracks every two months. Yeah. Someone's going to be in charge of doing that. Yeah, Being that more of a problem. Yeah, I think my understanding is the district will assume that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Because right after the work in the band room got done, um, I there had always been a crack in the third floor. I, maintenance came to me and said, that crack's gotten bigger. I said, well, define bigger. I mean, I knew that there had been a crack on the third floor, and I, uh, to what extent. So we have to, I want to start taking some measurements. I want to know if there is some movement taking place. I mean, it, the only way I know is just measure it, take pictures, and then let's measure it again, take some pictures in a month or two months or whatever. And, and I was out there when we were doing uh -huh. the hamburgers, and the crack on the third floor lines with the band room, <coughs> that grate that's running, and the stairs, if you look at the stairs on the bleacher, you could see where the caulking was, and 
the stairs have dropped about two inches. Yeah. So, you know, maybe not two inches, but at least an inch. I mean, there's a, a definitive gap where you, at some point in come time, caulking was there and the, the stair level has dropped. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and like I say, it was a it was a beautiful the day of the prime promise was yesterday, and and that water in the in the sewer was. It, it was, <laughs> they might have a, a sauna down there. I don't know, a pool and a sauna. I, I don't know what's going on down there, but. Uh, no, no. Okay. But we need to know before we start fixing things. So. Okay. There's no further discussion. Let's move to a place. Mr. Dobbins. Hi. Mr. Schuchert? Aye. Ms. Prowse? Aye. Mr. Sachaki? Aye. Mrs. Edder? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Uh, item number 9, superintendent's discussion comments. I'll try and get through this quickly. Uh, Steve Dakin was named superintendent of public instruction in Ohio by a vote of 14-4. Uh, just, just don't have a good feel for it at all. Mm -hmm. Two months ago, he was president of the State Board of Education, resigns from that position, then gets voted state superintendent of instruction by a vote of 14-4. That uh, doesn't pass the smell test. So, uh, um, Didn't he resign on a Friday and yeah. on a Monday? Or yeah, like just, that? Um, and I want to see the vote because hopefully Merle Johnson, our representative, will vote for him. But I, I, I haven't called it. Reach out to Merle. Uh, great recognition at CVC last night. Six students, uh, six of our students were the outstanding, outstanding students in their program. Fiona Navarro, Zach Bernstein, Josh Sanicki, Maddie Krasnowick, Lexi Baychak, and Dustin Cantler. Fiona Navarra was named the outstanding senior at the Career Center cute as could be. Uh, uh, she designed the cover for it. Uh, great night for Cog Heights at the Career Center. Prom Promise, uh, also a great job. I, I recognized Kelsey, did a fantastic job with that. Thanks to the three villages. Hilltop Towing always steps up and provides the cars for us. Great coordination on that. Um, Promises Friday at Windows in the River. Uh, pictures down at Valley View Woods has become a huge tradition in uh, directing traffic down there and, and always a great event if you can't get to want to see the kids uh, dressed at their best. Senior awards Tuesday the 27th at 7 o'clock. Um, what? 24th. 24th. I'm sorry. Did I say 27th? Yeah. I'm sorry. 24th at 7 o'clock. Um, great event. Uh, uh, lots of great things happening. Just a reminder, caps and gowns for graduation. Uh, if, if you've kept yours, please check and make sure you had it. If I've got it, I've still got it. If you need if you need one, remember they're based on your height, so let me know your height and I'll make sure we get one ordered. I've got hoods in there uh, based on what your major was. If I need to order one for you, shoot me an email and I'll get one for you. Ms. Prowse, this is your first time through with us? All righty. <laughs> <laughs> the shortest one you have. <laughs> you have one for the fifth graders. <laughs> 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 we'll make sure we get you going there. Um, had a great meeting with Chad about bringing over the not intervention specialist from the ESC. Um, actually, uh, uh, I think we'll be ready to do that. Maybe uh, I'm going to shoot some stuff to you in your Friday update about that. Uh, very few contractual things. Well, I think we'll get an MOU. We're ready to get an MOU done with them. Ran it by John. Looks pretty simple. Bring those nine people on board uh, with us. Uh, Matt's going to look into when now that he's done with the five-year forecast. I think where there's going to be a little bit of cost saving in insurance because the ESC's insurance is a little pricier than ours, but those people will come over uh, and, and probably just a little bit of a bump in pay. Nobody's going to take less pay, but uh, uh, they'll be our staff members and fit right into our schedule. So, um, best I sent you out. Uh, we're going to do a district tour. We're going to do that when school's out. Uh, I'm going to hopefully have different stations or break into three or four small groups, and that's going to be, we're going to spend the entire hour and a half, and I'm going to hopefully get Matt Hartman to record one also prior to, but I'm going to have a script and maybe have two or three different tour guides, and we're going to do kind of a nuts and bolts thing. We're going to go down the boiler room, and I'm going to show boilers, and we're going to, I'm going to get Tom Dalton to talk about the boilers a little bit. We're going to take you up on the rooftops and show you the roofs a little bit uh, about, and, and that's going to be kind of our kickoff uh, going into next year to say, my timeline, and I talked to Matt about this, but I need to talk to you about it more. A year from this fall is when we're going to be on be on the ballot for a levy. So that November of 23 is what we'd be looking at, uh, and that gives us some time to get all that stuff formulated and, and ready to go. Uh, what, how, and where? But but we really take a real hard look at it and get that best committee back up and looking at those real hard things, knowing that we're going to get some air conditioning done this summer and some roofs done this summer and, and keep going with that project. So um, um, the roofing supplies got delivered today. So we're ready to go with the roofing project at the start of the school or we meet with the AC people tomorrow. 
Uh, got the POs started for some of the ancillary gym cleanup. Chamber of Commerce luncheon was last week. Uh, probably need to cut back on my caffeine before that meeting next time around. Um, uh, that was the first. I think Bob Mangrick used Tom, the word Tom Evans and cute in the same sentence. I don't know that that was ever. What a, no, adorable. Adorable, right? Is that what he said? I have to correct him afterwards. Um, and then um, two days ago, we got the preliminary state test score results. Science, math. Science, math, and um, government. Social studies. Social studies. And just a cursory look at it, uh, performance index up about 11 points. Uh, and under the old system, that would have given us, that would have put us in the A category. Now, we're the stars. There's some things to still kind of work through. But uh, hats off to Mr. Jatovich, Mrs. Houchin, uh, kicked some butt and took some names on state testing first glance through. So our kids rose to the occasion. I think that just tells you how happy everybody was to be back in the building. So, and I, but, I mean, no thanks to me as all the teachers and the kids. I mean, they but, did a uh, good job preparing everybody that they, you know, they work hard every day and, and the results showed it. You know, all the way Mr. Jantovich was excited about the test prep that he got ready for him. And <laughs> but uh, no, it was, it was good. And you know, you always get a little bit anxious about that. And, and, and the overvalue of maybe some of the state testing, but uh, we, we put a lot of them, and our kids, and, and Mike and I just had this conversation the other day. You know, when I came here 11 years ago, I was, the importance that our kids take in any kind of testing is, is phenomenal. I mean, I mean our, our kids don't blow stuff off uh, because we take it seriously from the top down, and they've always, they always have, and we appreciate that. And I think that's, a, that's systemic throughout the district that, you go to other places and you don't see the same thing. You can walk into some districts and within five minutes of handing the test out, there's five or six heads down on the table because they're done. They're just done. They're checked out. They're cashed in. And, and there's very little of that that goes on here. So I, we're, I, we're thankful. And that's, that's everybody. That's parents at home reinforcing the importance of that. And that gives us a snapshot, a picture of where those kids are. That gives Brian some data. That gives Matt Young some data. That gives us a place to, to go. So I, I, I'm really, really happy with... Uh, with uh, where that puts us at. I'm anxious to see where some people at are around us. I know Matt talked to his brother down in uh, Ripley and theirs were in the toilet. So he, he was <laughs> so really, you know, happy with where we're at with ours. So and that's all I have. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, number 10, board discussion, committee reports, comments, etc. I, I will lead off and just mention that I was at Ron Thomas yesterday and uh, you attend that event and it's, it's a very sober and, and touching ceremony, but um, and it conveys a very important message, but it also illustrates the uh, great level of support and, and co or cooperation that we have among three villages. The safety forces were there, police, fire, EMS, everyone was there and chipping in to make that a successful event. So thank you, Mr. Janitore, and the staff for, for making that event, the, well, I'll call it the success that it was, but in quotes, time will tell. We hope the message was, was passed. That's all I have. Anything else this evening? I'll just, uh, Mr. Evans already talked about the senior recognition ceremony at the Career Center. I'll just follow up by saying there were at least two administrators who came up to me after the ceremony commenting about how, how enjoyable it is to have our students at the Career Center. That they're, they work hard, they know what they're there to do, they work at it very well, and they're very polite and easy to get along with. They were very, very complimentary of our students, in addition to pointing out the fact that we had more uh, outstanding students than any of us. <laughs> So, some good comments. Okay. Any other comments to see? I was going to say, um, I enjoyed going to the State of the uh, Schools um, Chamber of Commerce luncheon, and I think it's it's really um, an important event, and I'm, I'm so grateful that they include our school discussions um, at that chamber luncheon, because I really do think that it um, uh, highlights the best that we do, and it gives other um, people in our, um, you know, the Cuyahoga Valley, uh, understanding of what we do here. And I think, um, you know, Mr. Evans did a great job in his presentation of highlighting our, the good points that, a lot of things that we did this past year amongst the challenges that we had this past year. And um, I had a thought when Dr. Freed was speaking and he was talking about the um, communications class, the new communications class that's been well received this year and it and he was talking about the students doing their speeches and I was wondering if there was ever um, 
any interest or discussion about having a speech team at our school. Um, I did not have one in my high school, um, but speech was, I had my very first college class was a speech class, and from that class, I ended up being on the speech team at Kent State, where we competed in different categories. And um, I just felt like that's um, uh, a very, it was very, um, it was an enhanced learning experience because it gave you the opportunity to prepare speeches on different subjects and you know even had people that did you know after dinner speeches that you could see that they might be a comedian someday and then you had people that would do like um, you know they had their traditional speech categories like informative persuasive rhetorical criticism things like that but there were, they also had like um, I forget what they call it duet duo and it was almost like you acted out like a scene with a partner. So it, it was the different aspects of speaking. And um, it just felt like that's something that anyone could um, benefit from. So if there was ever anything like that to have a speech team, a competitive speech team, that's all. Mr. Dobbins? Aye. Mrs. Schuchert? Aye. Ms. Prouse? Aye. Mr. Suchaki? Aye. Mrs. Etter? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. It's 832. We are now adjourned in second session. Is this going to be a while? Should not. I just have to use the restroom. Well, well so do I. <laughs> so do I, so it better not be. Okay. <laughs> Dad, can you turn the recording off? Will there be any action network?